Oh no, Spasm's in trouble. Adam Curry, John C. Devorah. It's Thursday, December 20th, 2018. This is your award-winning Gibbo Nation Media Assassination Episode 1096. This is No Agenda. Smacking you with new knowledge and broadcasting live from the capital of the drone star state here in downtown Austin Tejas in the Cludio. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where I'm just back from making a batch of delicious homemade sauerkraut. I'm John C. Devorah. It's Crackpot and Buzzkill in the morning. And the recipe will be made available in the show notes. Won't it? Well, you know, it's just so simple. <laughs> I mean, once you you, you do enough finger. research, you find out how to make it. You go, this is yeah. idiotic. That why do you buy this stuff? What is uh, what is the basis of sauerkraut? Uh, Eight hundred grams of cabbage and one tablespoon of of uh, salt mixed together. Vinegar? No vinegar? No God, no, uh. no vinegar, no water. <laughs> That's it. It's cabbage, salt mixed together. Boom, kraut. There's some intermediate steps. Uh-huh. You have to be careful about certain things, but <laughs> just pretty a few, much. Just a few intermediate steps. Just a few. Well, here we are, everybody. It's December 20th, 2018. And I found the news to be interesting these last four days. Wow. Yes. What? Yes. Yes. Huh. I picked up some interesting stuff. I had some research. I liked it. I, I don't know. It was good. There's a lot going on. Okay. What did you pick up? I got a lot of random stuff. I didn't find any thematic things that would make me go ooh and ah. Oh, can I ooh and ah you then or try? Yeah, no, knock me out. <laughs> yeah, no, there it is. Contributing that's to one the and one. Contributing to the word cloud. Thank you very much. That's that's a new feature now. I think that uh, uh, Clogwog is doing. Tom from Australia yeah, for just, our he's trans. Just... Yeah, he's doing a, a word cloud over the art uh, of each episode. It's, it's interesting. I like it. Yeah, it's another part of our value for value network. You never know what shows up. It's always valuable somehow. That is so valuable. It is. Uh, a report came out. Big Senate commissioned report. Mm. And, uh, of course, some of the news outlets seem to have an advanced copy of this report the day before. I think this came out uh, Monday, Monday or maybe Tuesday. This is the Select Senate Intelligence Committee, Committee and they've published... Uh, two reports that they commissioned. And the first one is titled Computational Propaganda Research Project. That's from the uh, University of Oxford. I'm going to skip that one for today's uh, presentation. The second one is from a company based in Austin, which caught my eye, uh, called New Knowledge. And another thing caught my eye, the title of this report is The Tactics and Tropes of the Internet Research Agency. That would be the Russian troll farm. And what caught my mind, what caught my eye was the word tropes. Haven't we heard this used a little more? I mean, I think I, I recall saying, hey, what is this tropes thing they're using last week or the week before, maybe even? Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a while ago. Are you, are you in the shower? Are you just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping me, you were going to go on. Knock on, me no, out. No, no, no. You had to cut, cut me back. Well, what are you doing? Just tell me. Help me out. I'm print, printing the clip list. I forgot to do that. Oh, okay. Um, trope, meme, uh, cliche. Right, but... We uh, talked we, about the we word. We picked it up. It's a dubious... It's, it's one of those terms... I've had this the theory over the years, which is there are certain terms, if you read them or hear them or see them, you know what the political standing is of the person doing the writing. Trope is a left winger's term. It's like uh, chilling is another way. Ah. You see somebody uses the word chilling. Right. Uh, it tends to be someone that leans to the, le- to the left. That would make sense uh, when we dive into this report a little bit. But I just thought it was interesting that the word tropes had showed up or trope. Trope. Uh, or just before this report came out. I'm going to give you a backgrounder on this. Uh, actually, I'm not going to. I'm going to uh, give you a backgrounder <laughs> from NPR. And because this report has now proven once and for all that the Russians most definitely helped, not just helped, but probably elected Trump as president. Uh, yes. And the way they did it was not through advertising. No, no, no. No, that was nothing compared to what actually went on, and that was the fake accounts. The fake accounts were so good that they made made 
3 million African Americans stay home and not vote in this election. And that's why Hillary Clinton lost. And NPR explains. Two reports out today provide the clearest picture yet of the extent to which Russia went to influence voters ahead of the 2016 presidential election. The reports focus on a Russian troll factory's use of nearly every major social media platform from Facebook to YouTube. NPR Justice reporter Ryan Lucas has combed through the documents and joins us now. Hey, Ryan. Hi there. So who exactly authored these reports? Well, this is the work of... I I like how he combed through the documents. Does that mean he really looked at them or just did with just the three brushes? What does that mean? Combed through them. Is this the analyst? Let the clip play. I'm going to wait until you're back. It's, I, I, uh, I can't. Oh. Um, Hi there. So who exactly authored these reports? Well, this is the work of private researchers and cybersecurity experts. And what they did is... And note the private researchers and security experts. That's kind of code for this Austin startup company. Examine the activities of this Russian troll farm that we've talked a lot about. Now, the reports are based on data that the social media companies and the Senate Intelligence Committee provided them. Important to remember that the committee is investigating Russia's interference in the 2016 election. Right. It views its role as getting to the bottom of what the Russians did, and then explaining that to the American public. That's why we're able to see these reports. That, of course, stands in contrast to the special counsel's investigation, which is focused on criminal conduct and prosecuting those who broke the law. What do these new reports add that is actually new? Right. Well, first off, what they confirm bottom line is the big picture conclusions uh, that the U.S. intelligence community came to, which is that Russia's social media manipulation was designed to sow discord, to divide Americans, and to hurt Hillary Clinton, and ultimately to help Donald Trump. But they also provide a greater level of detail than we've previously had. Uh, They show that the IRA built up fake personas across uh, all sorts of social media platforms. That lent them legitimacy. But what's really interesting is the research shows that the Russians specifically targeted African-American communities at a higher rate than any other. Uh, Mm. And the Russians also pushed voter suppression narratives to a degree that the social media companies themselves have played down. So, okay, so you say the Uh Russians targeted African-American communities more than any other community. How did they do do that. Oh, yeah. how just how did they do that? Well, these efforts were focused on developing an audience and even recruiting assets. So people to act in the real world to say uh, stage rallies. Now, one of the reports says that uh, a main message that was pushed to African-American voters was that it was best to sit out the election, to boycott the election. Okay, that this served is their to suppress interest. turnout. Right. Ah. Um, and then one example of a fake persona that was created by the IRA that got a lot of traction mm-hmm. uh, is an Instagram account set up with the username of at Blackstagram, uh, and it had more than 300 thousand followers. One of the things that these reports made clear is that the Russians leveraged every major social media platform. Mm -hmm. Instagram had largely stayed under the radar. That's no longer the case. These Uh. reports say that Instagram was actually a huge part of Uh. Russia's efforts online. For example, (laughs) one of the reports says that fake Russian content on Facebook received 76.5 million engagements. On Instagram, fake Russian content earned more than two times as many engagements. as. Wow. Okay. This this is almost done this clip, but Stop there. The, you're talking apples and oranges when you're talking engagement. I looked just the other day at my Twitter statistics for a tweet I sent out, and I saw you know one person had created three engagements. So, so how do you do that? Well, you look, you saw it first, then you liked it. That's a second one. If you retweeted it, that's a third. So one user can create three engagements on Instagram. The w- reason why it's really apples to oranges is while you cannot retweet. Uh, just scrolling by will count as a view, and the the process of engaging on Instagram is just going through the timeline, double tapping on the picture. You don't even have to look at the comment or anything. And this is people do this incessantly: double tap, double tap, double, double tap, double tap. Double. So that to get huge engagement doesn't necessarily mean it's it's it was different from Facebook. That uh, and researchers say importantly, looking ahead, that the Russians have shifted a lot of their activity to Instagram since the election. Which is an important point. The Russians are still using social media to try to influence Americans. Right? That's absolutely, absolutely. right, uh, and it's a really important point to make that Russians continue to use fake accounts on, on these second. platforms for nefarious stop purposes. With, you got to stop with a logical. Every once in a while, you got to be logical here. If all that's true, and the Russians can do this, and they're doing it as we speak. How come they haven't done it to stop this stupid investigation? 
<laughs> they're trying really hard. They're so powerful. They got to up, up so the budget. They're so powerful that they can change the election, <laughs> but they apparently cannot stop this investigation. Hey, Ixnay on the object lay, okay? <laughs> so let's take a look at this company, New Knowledge, for just a brief second. We'll come back to them. Uh, they're in Austin. Uh, startup. They started at the Capital Factory. I know the Capital Factory well. I know Jason over there. It's a, kind of like an incubator where their business model is selling is it desks. An incubator or one of those just rent your office here? Um, as I was saying, it's an it's an incub well, like all incubators. They have you know, um, what do you call them? Their uh, mentors, and they rent you a desk. Of course, it's exactly what it is. That's what an incubator is, and they take stock in uh, in exchange for that. But also, there's some other um, interesting investors. Uh, we have the uh, here it is the GVV, which is a Chinese-based investor, and then we also have the um, let's see Lux Capital, which was set up in 2011 by former CIA director under Bill Clinton, James Woolsey. And they're also a partner in this company. Now, if you look at this company's homepage, newknowledge.com, what they do is the following. So hold on a second. You're telling me the Chinese and ex-CIA guys are promoting a, a, a kind of a narrative, we'll use that word, to, to sl- more or less, I'd say, uh, smear Trump because he didn't win the election logically or, or legitimately. Well, let's take it one. Although the CIA has been out to get Trump since day one, and there's no coincidence here. Let's take it a little further. Uh, Both co-founders of the company worked in the State Department in cyber uh, initiatives under Hillary Clinton. Uh, They are a member of the Alliance for Securing Democracy, uh, which is uh, counseled by Mike Chertoff, Bill Kristol, uh, Mike Morell, <laughs> John Podesta, Mike Rogers. I mean, this is, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously uh, a shill, but what's interesting is this company does do a certain kind of business right there on the homepage, protecting brands from social media disinformation attacks. New knowledge is a cybersecurity company specializing in disinformation defense for highly visible brands under attack by coordinated disinformation campaigns. Through machine learning and AI, we detect threats and provide brand manipulation protection before damage is done. And, you know, so they have big clients, and one of their clients is that, uh, uh, is the Advisory Council, or the, uh, sorry, the Alliance for Securing Democracies. That's one of their clients. This is who they work for. So it's obvious that they are, uh, as you already said, just by using the word trope, kind of shows they're they're left-leaning. But if you look at the entire, I'm not going to read anything from this report. John, it's a marketing report that you and I would have been proud of. A consultancy, you know, with graphs and Venn diagrams and colorful shit spouting off the page and numbers. and BS you want. And their conclusion is indeed that uh, uh, Russia succeeded with huge, just huge amounts of uh, social engineering through accounts they managed. Not through the ads, but through accounts. Uh, They managed to keep... Three million black Americans from coming out to vote, which interestingly is exactly the same amount of people that came out in addition to the black vote when Barack Obama uh, ran for president, uh, ran for reelection in 2012. You can see the graph. It goes up and it comes right down. Do they show here? Here's what I'd want to know immediately. The graph of the black Americans who didn't show up to vote. Uh, which was the number they have, the black Americans who did show up to vote when Barack Obama r- was running, and the black American, there goes the Zephyr, and the <laughs> black Americans who didn't show up in the previous election uh, with uh, George W. Bush. No, they don't go back to, well, they do. They have, a, they have a, a graph and a timeline, and it's kind of flat, and you see it start to so move they, up in 2008, but not really, the real, the real upward swing was 2012. According okay. according to their graph, uh, but uh, and otherwise so, it was kind so you of. Could, so I would compare the 2004 election to the 2016 election, and that would be my baseline for saying how the blacks normally. Yeah, unfortunately, vote. I don't think that works because they didn't do it by percentages, but by absolute numbers. So yes, it was more than 2004, but that could also be population. I mean, wait, wait, wait it was more than 2004. It was more than 2004. The, the, the Hillary vote. 
no, was yes. more than yes than the vote in 2004. Then what did this is making no sense to me at all. What they're saying is that the vote in 2012, the Hillary vote, uh, no, the, uh, the Obama re-election vote, it was up three million from 2008. So and that, what? Sorry. So what? Uh, exactly. In fact, NPR, in their own reporting on the same day, contradicts this. It's estimated that millions of people who voted for Barack Obama in 2012 stayed home during the 2016 presidential election. And many of those non-voters were black. For this political season, one big question is whether African Americans still feel like they have a home in the Democratic Party, a party that year after year depends on their votes. NPR political correspondent Asma Khalid reports from Cleveland. Many black voters I talk to say they have been loyal Democrats for years, and yet hardly anything has changed in their communities. Ifeolu Claytor is a 23-year-old working with the Ohio Young Black Democrats. He says his party has taken black votes for granted. And that's something that needs to change, clearly, because black millennials will just stay at home. It's not 1980 where people are still, like, kind of fresh, like our parents just got the right to vote. Claytor feels like Democrats are too focused on courting middle-class white voters. Focusing on waspy middle-class issues is not going to win in 2018 or 2020. But his friend and fellow Democrat, Gabrielle Jackson, insists the situation is improving. In 2016, she says some candidates simply refuse to engage with black voters. This year is different. We've had almost every gubernatorial candidate, we'll have all, them all by May, by the primary, come and talk to us about our issues and things that affect them. And Jackson says if politicians don't, they shouldn't expect votes. These people are recognizing that in order to win, um, you cannot ignore us. So maybe it wasn't the Russians, but maybe it was. I don't know. NPR seems a bit contradictory there in their reporting. Now, this here's the here's the line I liked. 1980, when our parents were first allowed to vote. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I know. Hey, man, don't you know that that was the first year that they were allowed to vote? 1980, when our parents were first allowed to vote. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's an interesting uh, well, uh, I, sense, of, sense of history. Well, I think what, what, what he means there is if you look at the... Uh, when, were they, when were they allowed to vote? They were allowed to vote after that, that amendment was passed. Which they amendment? Citizen. Yes. But I think, that, I think he's referring to the um, Civil Rights Act for some reason. Civil Rights Act? What? Was that 64. The yeah. Well, that's not 1980. No, no but, the, but if you were Reagan if you were elected. born so in 19, Reagan got elected, if you were born in 1960, then you would be able to vote in the 1980 election. Isn't that the point that he's making? So Even though it's wrong, parents were born in the 1960s, is what you said. That I think. Look, I'm I'm just trying to decipher this as well. I think what the guy said meant is. They were born uh, right before the Civil Rights Act, and they could actually vote uh, in the 80s. You could vote before the Civil Rights Act. Of course you could. I'm just <laughs> – I don't want to belabor this because it's NPR. It's stupid. Hello? It's stupid. I'm just well, pointing it out. called out for their lack of hi- historic – I mean, when you get kids coming home from school – Saying and this they kind say of crap. That, you know, <laughs> Christopher Columbus was a slaver, and that's what he's best known for, that – Martin Luther King fra- freed the slaves. My favorite one that I got from one of my oh, kids. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> right out of right out of grammar school. Oh, geez. You have to wonder what he's this kid's thinking when he says that. I'm thinking he's someone told him this. So this uh, new knowledge company, which is only two years old, came out of their nonprofit lobbying uh, organization called Data for Democracy. And this was set up when they were all working in the State Department. And luckily, I was able to find one of these co-founders, Rene DiResta, uh, who co-founded the outfit with Jonathan Morgan, which is a fun name to search on. Uh, And I happened to pick up a a little snippet of an interview that she did with... uh, Kira Schwisher, Schwisher. Yeah, so Data for Democracy is a data science collective. There's about mm-hmm. uh, 3,000 members, um, and it is 
much bigger than just disinformation. Uh, right. There's channels in there where people are looking at vehicular traffic fatality data, where people mm-hmm. are looking at gerrymandering, uh, voter registration. Uh, it's just a collective of data scientists who are interested in using their skills to make a difference in the world, mostly mm-hmm. social good projects. Sure. Uh, one of the channels in there is related to disinformation and misinformation. Mm-hmm. When we started realizing the extent to which this was a problem, I began doing some advising um, in Congress. And as uh-huh. you know, at the time, I was actually working at a supply chain logistics company that I had helped found. Mm-hmm. It got to be a little bit difficult explaining why I worked in supply chain logistics, but also this was like my uh, my, mm-hmm. my passion project. Um, so we decided that we would spin up a policy team uh, at Data for Democracy, whereby we could do a little bit of lobbying and advocacy faster. work as <laughs> independent tech, independent techies, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. New Knowledge uh-huh. is a company that builds detection and mitigation technologies specifically for manipulated narratives. So mm-hmm. there is social listening where brands Ooh. will get alerted to uh, social uh, listening. Um, you know, they have 500 mentions of Coca-Cola, for example. Um, what new knowledge does is we ascertain whether or not those mentions are organic or if they're a kind of coordinated campaign to right. uh, impact the reputation of the yeah. brand. Mm-hmm. And I and then right around the same time, Um, I met Jonathan Morgan, who's the founder of New Knowledge, and we met because we were asked to do some analysis of uh, extremist content. I've lost the plot. No, she's the data for dec- no, democracy no, no. girl. No, no. So, this came I'm going to tell you new I'm, knowledge. No, exactly the opposite. They started data for democracy when they were working for Hillary Clinton in the State Department, and then as disinformation started to crop up. Uh, they saw an opportunity for business, so they say. I don't know if the CIA investment or the Chertoff group or any of those guys had anything to do with that decision, uh, but then they started uh, New Knowledge. Okay. Of New Knowledge, and we met because we were asked to do some analysis of uh, extremist content on social media, <laughs> specifically ISIS. Now, Jonathan was one of the uh, authors of yes, the ISIS Twitter. Who? They were by Congress. She doesn't say who in Congress. Where they really went in there. And the same kind of work that um, Galad Lotan and I had done on mapping the anti-vax conversation and the mm-hmm. way that they were using kind of affinity marketing and co-opting hashtags mm-hmm. and trying to grow their numbers, trying to look a lot bigger than they were. Mm-hmm. Um, Jonathan was doing very similar types of analysis on ISIS mm-hmm. and on violent extremism. Um, there were a lot of parallels in how the technology was being used. You know, the conspiracy theorists were relying on these new, you know, algorithmic amplification, oh, megaphones, algorithmic ease of amplification. connecting with each other um, to spread their message. And ISIS was building a virtual caliphate, oh. which both things at the time were largely being run completely undisturbed because mm-hmm. nobody could convince the social platforms that right. this was worth their but it's time. Because they're using them exactly the way they were built. Yes. Exactly. You know what I mean? In fact. Uh, the week before the election, uh, Jonathan Morgan was tweeting and uh, writing up media, and all of this is in the show notes, writing up medium pages and pages, not about Russia. No, alt-right, alt-right, KKK, that's who, oh, they're all over the, even though Trump's going to lose, watch out, alt-right has, has captured, they've dominated Facebook, ah! not a word about the Russians. And so then they obviously were tasked uh, just recently to create this new narrative, which you could do with data for anything you want. It's it's really a big piece of fluff. But what happened this morning, and this is why I think it's interesting, big bombshell news in the New York Times. Secret experiment in Alabama Senate race imitated Russian tactics. I shall read you a few paragraphs. Oh, brother. As Russia's online election machinations came to light last year, a group of Democratic tech experts decided to try out similarly deceptive tactics in the fiercely contested Alabama Senate race, according to people familiar with the efforts and a report on its results. The secret project carried out on Facebook and Twitter was likely to have small... Too small to have significant effect on the race in which the Democratic candidate was designed to help Doug Jones edged out the Republican Roy Moore, but it was a sign that American political operatives of both parties have paid close attention to the Russian methods, which some fear may come to taint elections in the United States. One participant in the Alabama project, Jonathan Morgan, is the chief executive of New Knowledge, a small cybersecurity firm that wrote a scathing account of Russia's social media operations in the 2016 election. These guys used their own tactics or the tactics that they accuse the Russians of to only slightly, just slightly, too small really to do anything, 
to slightly alter the results of the Alabama Senate race. Oh, to push it towards Stacey. Uh, no, the other guy, Jones. Why? why okay. So it's Jones, the same the, people. The, yes, but how does it make any sense? We've already determined that these people are lefties. They want the social good. They got all the, the right phrases. They want the right buzzwords. So why would they? Why would these same people go into Alabama to screw the lefty no, that's no, running no. against the white guy? You completely misunderstood it. Okay. <laughs> they. Well, that's what I. That's why I asked the original question. It was designed to help Doug Jones. I thought he's the Republican. Moore is the Republican. Oh, I'm thinking of Stacey. I'm thinking of the other race. This is what? What state is this? Alabama. Where's the what? What was Stacy? Who cares? Who cares? Don't get don't get lost on that. I, I do want to know why, because I don't want to lose track of the of the plot here. Because Stacy, the the one woman who who ran for something in one of these states, I forgot already, uh, was the the real lefty that should have been helped if they're going to help anybody. She almost won. I, I don't know what what that. I don't know how that contributes to the story. The point, well, what, I, what it contributes to the story is why would you help? Because I was mixed up. The oh, okay. way you presented the story, it sounded as though they were helping the Republicans. No, I read it verbatim from the New York Times. You, okay. The secret project carried out on Facebook and Twitter was likely too small to have a significant inf- effect on the race in which the Democratic yeah. candidate was designed to help. Who? Doug Jones, who okay. edged out the Republican Roy S. S. Moore. Okay, Roy uh, Moore and. Yes. So, but they. Oh but, wait, you know, this is this is not the most recent election. This no, is the, no. the more thing. Yes, that place. yes, yes, yes. Oh, the special election. Yes. Now you're with me. Okay. So this company. Oh, so that guy. Uh, you know. Okay. Well, that. <laughs> that guy Moore was the loser. I mean, that, this that, company. That's that's beside the point. Yeah. This company. That is now being touted as the cybersecurity expert firm that can prove that the Russians made Trump win by suppressing black Americans, millions of them, did this exact same thing to a small degree yeah. in the special election. These guys yeah. are, they may have done the Russian stuff for all I know, but that's what's being touted as the proof, the proof that this took place. Okay, well, if they did that in that Moore election, that means they did it in these other elections. Thank you very much. It's possible that they're the ones responsible for the woman in Arizona. Long time. They'll vote any Republican in as U.S. senator. Somehow, this uh, the Democrat won. And Beto came pretty close to winning in a really staunch Republican state. So these guys are, are using this technology that they've discovered, yes. or they think they have, to, to slant the elections. These guys should be jailed. And remember, they're in Austin, Texas. The whole Beto thing was, you know, it was a Texas, Texas event, obviously. And it didn't work, so maybe it, you still need your traditional ways of marketing and mind control, which, of it course... It almost worked. <laughs> it almost worked. But yeah, I, I would say that it is a, a possibility these guys did that. They certainly know how to do it. The investigation needs to get underway if they did anything in Arizona. The Arizona thing has always concerned me. It really makes no sense to me that this, that it's two women, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat. The Democrats or the Republicans always win that state. It was John McCain's seat. And it goes to this Democrat for some reason. Uh, Okay, well, hold on a second. So now you're going to tell me that these kind of tactics actually work. I'm going to, yeah. Because I agree. I think they do. I think the internet Why is a massive mind-controlling machine. And if you, if you have some of the elements right, I think you can do, you can do a lot, particularly if you can uh, meld mainstream media into the, into the loop. I think absolutely They've always works. been in the loop. Well, there's no loop without them. The, the social networks need the mainstream, and mainstream needs the social networks. It, it's a continuous loop. They, they so need each other. I would say other. that all these contested elections all need to be done over again. <laughs> <laughs> no? Well, does it, do you, but how do you stop that what they did? You don't, but it's, it's the same. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, it happens everywhere. Newspapers are you know, subjective. 
uh, television advertising, political advertising. It's what we do. We mind control people in America. Here, take this pill. You'll live longer. Come on. This is our, this is our foam finger number one. And now we do it on Facebook. And that's okay. I'm, I'm totally, well, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure Instagram really did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm sure. Yeah. This report is something that every marketer should take a look at because it's, it's showing you how you can take data, just any old data really, and convince your client you did a good job and giving them the answer they wanted to hear with a lot of pretty yeah, colors. Yeah, that's what you're impressed with, I could tell the most. <laughs> and, and they have a lot of examples of these memes that were created that were so stupid. I mean, I did not see a single meme there that looked like it would do anything. But somehow the Blackstagram Instagram account with 300,000 um, followers translated to 3 million black Americans staying home. And that's yeah, why Hillary well, lost. It's, well, there's, yeah. But I'm going to go visit this company. I want to meet them now. They're right up the street. Yeah. You hey. should go in there and get a job. No, probably get the more money you're making on the show. <laughs> say, hey, can you guys make me president? <laughs> that would be fun. But this, of course, it doesn't it, take a lot of these. The thing that I think the point is, is that uh, and the Judge Roy Moore thing is a good example, which is I was confused and I'm sorry. That's all right. It was a, uh, is that a lot of these elections at this point, because we we both know and everybody who listens to the show knows the Democrat and Republican parties are pretty much the same. And it's just a matter of the way they slant things. Yeah. And so the elections are close. These are not elections and funded by the same ones. funded by the same people. Yeah, and they're close, and they're generally speaking, one guy will win or lose by uh, one or two percent of the vote. And so it doesn't really take much to tweak it a little bit to get the other guy to win. No. Uh, and that's where I think the danger is. But both parties have access to the same way of doing things. For a long time, the, the Republicans always said, well, the Democrats are so far ahead of us when it comes to using data. They're so far ahead of us when it comes to producing documentaries, which means that you know, <laughs> yeah. Michael Moore, one guy, is so <laughs> yeah. far ahead. Those very successful, well, well watched documentaries. And so they, you know, so now everyone's doing documentaries, and they're and they get their computer together. But before that, during the Reagan administration, when uh, uh, Richard, I think it's Richard Vigory, was very famous uh, direct marketing guy, and who's written a, written a number of books on the topic. Uh, everyone pointed to him and saying, we're never going to win because we don't have the technology. We don't know what we're doing when it comes to direct marketing. Right, and, right. And it's just the same, you know, it's like a, it's a, uh, well, we've learned from, race. we've learned from Brad Pascal who did the, you know, from the, um, uh, was it the, uh, the PBS interview? We learned that really it was just about scale, spending a hundred million dollars, <laughs> you know, spending it, uh, on people who would likely vote for Trump. That was pretty much all they did. So you still need scale. You still need lots of money. You need to repeat it over and over and over again. Yeah, 300,000 uh, followers on some obscure Instagram account is not going to keep some grandma who doesn't even know what Instagram is from voting. She's not going to vote because she doesn't like the candidate. We heard, Hillary, well, we already heard. She won't vote for a Republican, so she'll stay home. Yeah, we heard. That's exactly what we heard from NPR's own reporting on the same day they were. They report that, huh, clearly, clearly it was the Russian troll farm. Very the great messaging. They're, they're the best marketers in the world. We should hire them yeah. to promote no agenda. We should. Well, I find it despicable. That, I wonder if they could ever sell a car in this country. They're such great marketing people. Yeah. So there's your deconstruction of what you'll be hearing a lot of in the coming few days that that's what happened. It's a fact. Russia did it. Impeach Trump. <laughs> yeah. I do beseech you must impeach. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. That was good. That was outstanding. I couldn't give you a clip of the day. For no, there's not enough clips. Thing. No, there's no clips. There's no. I do have a couple, just a few loose things, two loose clips. I just want to get rid of the short. Uh, this is, uh, since we're talking about collusion with these types of companies, uh, we always had CrowdStrike in our uh, in our sites since they um, are staffed by Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians who hate Russia and uh, also have a lot of intelligence investment behind them. 
This is Sidney Powell, author of License to Lie on Comey and the CrowdStrike Collusion. Sydney. Oh, I think it goes back to 2012, Lou. What we really need disclosed is the FISA court decision and to know who the private contractors are that Mr. Comey gave unlimited access to the raw FISA intel to. I think one of them was Fusion GPS. The other might have been CrowdStrike. They were accessing the NSA database probably for private profit. <laughs> it's going to be the scandal of the century. We need to know who those people are. Yeah. yeah. For, for, they were accessing the NSA database for private Ukrainian, Ukrainian mafia. <laughs> it's too bad John McCain's dead because he's the link to all that. And that guy was the link with everything. If he's dead, sometimes I wonder. Uh, quickie here, last one. This is oh, not really quickie, minute and a half. Washington Post, Greg Miller. I guess he's, he's a famous guy, isn't he? Like one of their big writers? Well, anyone with the name Miller is always possibly famous. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the Times in particular. Yeah, you know, they were the, the Washington Post was one of the first companies to uh, oh, get a, a, a preview. Wapo, wapo, wapo. To get a preview look of the Steele dossier. Dossier. And here's what he said about it. In the book is, uh, is Michael Steele, the uh, author of the, of the infamous do- dossier. And uh, he secretly went to the Washington Post in September 2016 when he was trying to get word out about some of his findings and he met with a couple of reporters there for two hours i i don't think you 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 were one of them but two of your colleagues and he, and he elaborated on his uh, his dossier and of course what uh, some of the things that's that that are in that dossier have, have proven true uh, other elements haven't uh, been substantial yeah, you'll notice they don't actually mention which parts have proven true but he goes into the ones that have not been proven at, at least uh, not not yet um, but but what, what do you think of the dossier overall? Uh, I think that overall, like in its, in its broadest, it's most accurate in its broadest, most sweeping assertions and conclusions. It's the, the narrower you get and the more particular you get, the harder it is to figure out whether it's on the mark. Um, so, you know, the very first memo that he writes um, it, that is now part of you know this collection of memos that we call the dossier talks about Russia is waging a campaign to interfere in the American election with the goal of helping to elect Donald Trump. I mean, he's writing that way before any of us are writing it, and way before the he's CIA the is even reaching that conclusion. So he's way ahead there. You know, the the, the thing that people I think remember the most vividly about the. The dossier is, you know, the idea that there's a tape somewhere, some compromise of Trump consorting with prostitutes at the Ritz-Carlton and in Moscow. I mean, could be. I mean, given what we know about Trump, it certainly wouldn't be outside the realm of the possible that this happened, but we've seen no evidence. We, we still, we, and it's not for lack of trying. I mean, there's other material in the dossier. We, we literally spent weeks and months trying to run down. There's an assertion in there that Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, went to Prague uh, to settle payments that were needed at the end of the campaign. We sent reporters through every hotel in Prague, through all over the place, trying to, I, just to try to figure out if he was ever there. Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. I have a question He's about that. There. Is that is that really their job as journalists to send uh, reporters to every hotel to to basically help the Mueller investigation? Is that really their job? Well, was it to help the Mueller investigation? No, is it? it but even as journalists, I mean, and, of course, Washington Post. So they always think that they are, you know, all the president's men. That this is, you know, the 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 Watergate scandal. So that's why they. Puts, I mean, they put a lot of resources into this for, you know, companies that, or an industry that says they don't have that. They put a lot of resources into it. And I, this made me think, isn't the job of journalists in the connected world, isn't it just invalid? I don't and I'll, no, let, let me I explain. Don't let, me, so. let me explain. Let me explain. So if you have events, right? The news is an event. An event takes place and then it really becomes an event based upon, you know, how big it is or how important people think it is. For every event, let's just take a air a crash, an airplane. Um there's online there's hundreds of people who know exactly what's going on that are writing about it. And a journalist these days, all I see them do is troll Twitter to find these people 
and then to rewrite their shitty story, which is always wrong because of page, you know, constraints and and just not hearing things right, not understanding because they're not the experts. The journalists are experts in nothing. I think that used to be a good thing. I think it's the only thing really you only need an editor. You need an editor and then you can put some opinion around something. Journal, I think it's an invalid occupation. It is. Okay. Uh, we're doing it. I'm not a journalist. I wasn't schooled as a journalist. You are a journalist. You don't know that. No, no. I'm a podcaster. No, you're a journalist. Podcasters you're doing are journalism. The... What you did today with that initial report is all journalism. So just because you don't like to call yourself a journalist because you think it's an insulting name because you have higher a higher view of yourself, podcaster, for example, which is a higher. It's uh, higher calling, than, think, journalism. than journalism. Higher than journalism. Yes. So you're actually bringing me down. No, you're bringing yourself down by doing good journalism. Oh. <laughs> Damn it. Foiled again. You're doing what they should be doing. These guys, I mean, the whole show that we do is what other people should be doing. Nobody's doing it. They don't care to. They got a hidden agenda. Not so hidden. <laughs> yeah. And that's all they do. So they secret. <laughs> so secret. Oh, man. Anyway. That, that'll that take you through Monday. I'm sure there'll still be whining and crying about it. Ah! <laughs> Black stayed home because of Russians. Please. Please. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Brexit. Like, do you have any updates? I got some, like, a few things. I do have an update. They're, they're finally all caving into the idea of having another. I want to play the Farage <laughs> clip. I said I was going to play some clips from the... Leave me yes. leave conference. Yes, I did watch that. Thanks for sending the link. It was interesting. Yeah, I thought it was very educational. Yeah. And here's Farage at the very end uh, giving his, uh, he's not the last speaker, but he's, uh, which I think galled him a little bit, but he uh, has, he brings up the thing that we've been bringing up since day one, two years ago. Of outright rescinding it is they know that is impossible for this country to accept. They have managed in the past to engineer second referendums in Denmark. They've done it twice in Ireland. And my message, folks, tonight, as much as I don't want a second referendum, it would be wrong of us here on a Leave Means Leave platform not to get ready, not to prepare for the worst-case scenario. You know, we must not, we must not fail in our preparation. We really must not do that because I fear they'll do this to us. And if I'm wrong, we've lost nothing. But this organisation, which I joined a few months ago and which has held these events up and down the country, we've now got to move into a different gear. We've now got to start forming branches and active groups all over this country. We've got to be out there. Yeah, uh, too little, too late maybe. Farage? Uh, we'll see. I have, a, I have a quickie intermezzo. This is a conservative politician, Andrea Leedsom, with a the truth always wants to come out moment. We love these on the No Agenda show. You can't stop the truth from slipping out of your pie hole. There is a deal on the table, but Parliament doesn't support it, raising the risk, some argue, of leaving without an agreement. We're preparing for all eventualities. We're certainly not intending to have no deal Brexit, but Parliament does need to vote for a deal. Otherwise, the legal default position is we will head for no Brexit, no deal in March 2019. <laughs> I mean, no deal, not no break, no deal. Interesting. <laughs> uh, no Brexit. Oops. Yes. Yeah. There's a, you got more on? I got a couple more. If you... I don't think I, I think that my Farage thing, I think is the only thing I'm looking up and down this list that I have about the Brexit. I think that's it. You've got Bre- your Brexit again, it's all yours. Okay. I've got, uh, well, you know, what, uh, what is being touted as this is what it's all about, which I don't believe for a second, is the Northern Ireland, Ireland situation with the border. And briefly, Ireland is staying in the European Union. So even though that's completely separated from the mainland, that is seen as a, a border, a EU border with the UK, uh, as Northern Ireland is with the UK. Now, this has not been an enforced border or any kind of barricades for 30 years. It was a, a right mess. 
back in the 70s and 80s. And I remember living in Europe, man, with the IRA blowing shit up everywhere. I, I remember visiting London and and they blew up a bunch of things around us. And they, they we wanted to go to take the kids to the big toy store, Henley's, whatever it's called. And they blew it up. Well, they blew up to something in front of it. Yeah. So it's, you know, they've, they've had a lot That's of, it. and they've settled that. And I think it's been very calm and, you know, there is no border. In fact, I have a report from Euro News um, and the reporters were on the scene about the fears of the return of a border post-Brexit. The Irish border, more open than almost any in the world, with more roads crossing it than between the US and Canada or Russia and Eastern Europe. The border runs right down the middle of this river, and here in the town, it's invisible. I'm crossing now from Ireland into the UK. Easy. And that's the way people here want it to stay. Today already I was across the border maybe five times. You've been across five times today? Yeah. And that's perfectly normal? Perfectly normal for anybody here. So road closures? Be a disaster. After Brexit, this will be Britain's only land border with the European Union. There are real fears here that if Britain crashes out of the EU without a deal, a so-called hard border will be imposed. Customs officials, police, soldiers, soldiers. of two countries. Yes. It was militarised yes. and it was a pain in the neck. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's all gone. Reviving a guarded border wouldn't be easy. This church is in the UK. Its graveyard is in Ireland. The old border <laughs> posts are abandoned. But hardline British Brexiteers would put them back so Britain could be free forever of EU ties. And that prospect stirs fears here of violence. You put up physical infrastructure that people can protest at, or God forbid somebody can attack, the genie gets out of the bottle very quick. The genie of violence. Yes, possibly. Yes. It might never it'll never be we hope it'll never happen. It'll never be on the scale, but you would see sporadic attacks. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think you have to worry about it because the liberal world order, the new world order, the global order, the globalists, they do not want this to happen and they're going to do everything they can. And in fact, uh, nothing can take place, no vote, no parliamentary vote, nothing can happen before January 19th because the propaganda needs to drop on January 19th. And this propaganda uh, is produced by HBO and it is uh, called Brexit. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is the star, so it's uh, they pulled out all the stops for this. It took a little piece from the trailer. We are about to ask the biggest question in a generation. In or out? And we need a leader. How to change the course of history. We have to hack the political system. Hack it. I'm talking about altering the matrix of politics. Social media platforms are designed to find like-minded people. Our software will locate and target people that no campaign has ever targeted before. People who don't and have never voted. Three million extra votes that the other side have no idea exist. This is an insurgence against the establishment. We're going to build something that will restock the odds in our favor. What are your expectations, realistically? To create the biggest political upset since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Very large. Yeah. Let's take back control! So it seems like they're going to show us very similar to the three million blacks in America that uh, Data and Cambridge Analytica and Steve Bannon and the Russians, and bleh, that they manipulated everything. So three million people were found who never voted, who hated everything and wanted to Brexit. It's this really disgusting. It's quite astounding. Who got paid money to do this? Well, this is HBO, so uh, Time Warner owns HBO. Do they not? I think they still own HBO. I think they still do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, well, big, it's Hollywood. It's hey, Hollywood. Cum- it's Hollywood. You get cum- Hollywood elites. They don't want any of this stuff going on. They're not working for the public anymore. <laughs> but John, They're working for the uh, elitists. But also, this is played by Sherlock Holmes. This is the funny Cumberbatch? thing. Cumberbatch? Yeah. Cumberbatch is starring in this thing. Oh, Cumberbatch, well, you should be boycotted. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the propaganda's real. Uh, <laughs> funny, quick funny quote, just to... 
eight seconder from Parliament. I think someone was talking about uh, a parliamentary ejection, but it came out wrong. And here's what the Prime Minister said. I'm tempted to say to the Honourable Lady, if she looks carefully, I think she'll see that I'm not capable of a parliamentary ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, clip of the day. Finally, <laughs> of all the things you get, clip of the day. Clip of the day. <laughs> this is the level that our show is really at. <laughs> but we know it works. We know that the lowbrow stuff works. This is what you have to do. That's all people will remember from this expose. She said <laughs> ejaculation. She said ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I told you I've been having fun with the news. There's interesting stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, you, you're on a roll. Yeah. I'll let you go. No, you got something, surely. No, I got nothing. Uh, I got mostly small stuff. All but right. Let's talk about a couple of things that are important. I think. So <laughs> besides, besides, bre- besides Brexit. <laughs> let's get to something. And now for something important. Yeah. <laughs> something important to us. <laughs> um, I think we got Brexit covered. Yeah. Of course, we've always had Brexit covered. We knew what was going on from the get-go. We, now it's, well, gonna... it's not fair. We, As you pointed out uh, a couple of weeks ago, it's, we, we don't play with a, you know the same deck of cards as everybody else. We're from the future. So we know what's going to happen. So let's listen to what Democracy Now! has to say about Flynn. Ah, yes. Flynn. In Washington, D.C., a federal judge has delayed sentencing for Michael Flynn, President Trump's former national security advisor, after expressing disgust that Flynn lied to federal investigators. Flynn's acknowledged he lied about his meeting with Russia's ambassador during the 2016 presidential campaign, admitted he worked as an underregistered foreign agent for Turkey's government. In an extraordinary two-hour hearing, U.S. District Judge Emmett Sullivan Tuesday blasted Flynn for his conduct, pointing to an American flag inside the courtroom, as he said, arguably, you sold your country out. Judge Sullivan offered to hold off on sentencing Flynn if he agreed to continue to aid federal prosecutors with special counsel Robert Mueller's probe and other criminal investigations. Flynn agreed to the deal, delaying any sentencing until at least March. The court seized Flynn's passport and ordered him to remain within 50 miles of Washington, D.C. At the White House, Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders deflected questions about Flynn's court appearance, saying only that the White House is concerned that Flynn lied to the fbi i have some thoughts on this what i have some thoughts on this yeah well the couple of i did give you a few initial thoughts i uh, first of all when this guy this judge who's apparently was like shopped because he's oh yeah no, he, he's a was a, judge. yeah he, he hates uh, trump well, we don't know that yeah we he's yeah he's the, he, he did some other rulings against well, trump stuff. let me back up According to the right wingers, uh-huh. he was shopped by Flynn's people and the Flynn lawyers who thought he might be amenable because he was a Reagan appointee. Gotcha. I believe he may have been a Bush, but I think it was Reagan. He's old. And so they found this guy. And then immediately he goes into the timeline of the FBI and how they indicted uh, Flynn, showing that, you know, he, he lied that they didn't file a report for weeks. And it was a really very poorly done FBI work but flynn you know rolled over because it would they supposedly threatened his family with you know we're going to prosecute your kid if you don't right you know roll over okay so he did that and so it looked like the judge according to the right wingers was going to you know to kick this whole thing out and maybe indict flynn and now indict uh mueller he's going to end up in jail mueller's going to end up in jail somehow <laughs> in <the right> wing. <laughs> yeah sure and so i'm listening to all this and then now all of a sudden this turns around the other way where the guy's not even concentrating on the uh, line to the FBI, but other stuff that he thinks the FBI should have indicted him for. Yeah. And now it's Flynn's in a heap of trouble. Well, okay, your so the show has a little bit, is involved with this a little bit, I think. Uh, you recall that just around the time uh, Trump was elected, through our military intelligence channels, we got a request about uh, Mark Hall's movie. Um, <clears throat> which is Killing Ed, about the Gulen uh, movement and financing of the Harmony Schools and all of the, uh, what do you call them? The uh, charter, <laughs> charter, charter, yeah, charter schools and and all this infiltration. And, and of course, it was Fatula Gulen is the CIA protected uh, Turkish cleric who's been hiding out in the Poconos. And Flynn wanted to see this movie. And so I connected everybody with, yeah, I connected everybody. And so they saw this movie, uh, and, and we the, both saw it too. Yeah, it's a great movie. It's something. It's not just about 
uh, it's not about Flynn or Turkey or or Gulen, but yeah, you have to see this movie called Killing Ed. And but this the evening before this uh, Flynn sentencing, two associates of Flynn were indicted on conspiracy charges related to Fatula Gulen. And this may also have to do with the failed coup, and it's possible that Flynn was also involved in that. Here is a uh, a quick little back and forth at the Doha Forum. This is the Turkey Foreign Minister, and listen closely to what he... I may have to stop and, and tell you what he says. Another question that's been revolving around these conversations has been the fate of Fethullah Gulen and what will happen to him next. Has there been progress made by your government in discussions to have him extradited back to Turkey? Well, uh, everybody was focusing on this Pastor Branson, who is also a CIA agent. I'm also a very straightforward person like Erdogan. Yeah, I like that. So what, what we were talking about, he said that hey, the pastor, Pastor Brown, that everyone was focused on, he's a CIA agent. Let's just be honest about it. Thank yeah, you. that's the guy that they, they were holding. And then we did a bunch of deals to get him released. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Trump was all in for getting him released. Oh, yeah. Who is also a CIA agent. I'm also a very straightforward person like Erdogan. But it was a minor issue in our relations. We have more serious problems we had. One of them is the U.S. supports to YPG PKK in Syria, which are posing threat to our national security. And the second serious problem is the perpetrator of the attempted coup, uh, the leader of this terrorist organization, uh, uh, are still in the United States. But recently, I have seen the credible investigation of the FBI in several states, and they have uh, actually seen or noticed the darkness of this organization and how they have been violating the U.S. laws, including tax fraud, visa fraud, and also some other illegal activities, and how professional they are. This is what FBI is telling us. So our expectation is also very clear. We have the bilateral agreements and international law is there, and... They, this guy and the uh, other others belonging to this organization, 84 names that we have requested the United States to extradite, they should be extradited to Turkey. Do you believe you're closer to having that happen? President Trump told Erdogan that they have been working on that. So here's, here's the data points we have. So Flynn is just the tip of the iceberg. These associates of him or ex-associates who were indicted the evening before his sentencing, which I believe delayed his sentencing, comes at the same time Trump announces we're pulling out of Syria. Of course, the YPG, as you just heard, this is a big problem for Turkey. They hate the Kurds. They want to go down there and they want to you know, get rid of them. They want to run Syria or whoever. So now, I don't even know who's who and who's friends with who. Add to that that we just requested to sell a Patriot missile system to Turkey. I believe that Trump has done some kind of deal, or he's in the middle. I don't know if it's his deal. He's in the middle of some kind of deal. Somebody's deal. And Turkey is really the way they want it, because they want to be the center of the universe the way they were when it was Constantinople and the Ottoman Empire. And this is all related. Khashoggi is related. Um, Flynn uh, and the Gulen uh, extradition is related. There's some deal. And really, I think that we're just... I think Trump is pulling us out of everything. Let him have it. Well, let's listen to that clip then. This is All American Troops Out of Syria, Part 1. All American troops in Syria are leaving. The president tweeted, We have defeated ISIS in Syria, my only reason for being there during the Trump presidency. The first Americans arrived in October of 2015. They have since helped push ISIS into a few isolated areas. About 2,000 American troops are there now. But today's announcement still stunned some top Republicans who believe more work needs to be done. David Martin begins our coverage. The president claimed ISIS in Syria is defeated. So our boys, our young women, our men, they're all coming back, and they're coming back now. We won. And it is true the territory (laughs) ISIS once held, the so-called caliphate, has been reduced to just a few pockets. But the fighting remains fierce. Last week, the U.S. and its allies launched more than 200 air and artillery strikes, many of them called in by American Special Operations Forces working with local fighters on the ground. 
The president's decision was denounced by members of his own party. I doubt there's anybody in the Republican caucus in the Senate that just isn't stunned by this precipitous decision that just like you woke up in the morning and made it. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham called for hearings to determine whether the pullout is based on military advice or in spite of it. The abrupt withdrawal runs counter to U.S. strategy, as explained little more than a week ago by a senior State Department official. I think it's fair to say Americans will remain on the ground uh, after the physical defeat of the caliphate until we have the pieces in place to ensure that that defeat is enduring. Well, Joint Chiefs Chairman General Joseph Dunford recently explained what that would take. We estimate, for example, about 35 to 40,000 local forces have to be trained and equipped in order to provide stability. Uh, we're probably somewhere on along the line of 20 percent through the training of those forces. For Dunford, that meant U.S. troops wouldn't be leaving anytime soon. But the president's mind appears to have been made up since March. We're going to be coming out of there real soon. Going to get back to our country where we belong. So after four years and the loss of four American servicemen, senior military leaders are scrambling to get all U.S. troops out of Syria in 30 days or as soon after as possible. They're also wondering what comes next, since President Trump has said his instincts tell him to pull out of Afghanistan as well. Jeff? David Martin mm-hmm. at the Pentagon Force. David, thank you. Hmm. So that's the, the kind of the basic... Now, don't forget, CBS is the... Uh, Mouthpiece of the CIA for all practical purposes. Yep. So we're getting good information. So let's listen to what Holly Williams, the the uh, foreign correspondent who's floating around. She's always in Istanbul <laughs> of reporting from every place else. But here she is. And this has got a little kicker on it that I thought was kind of interesting. OK, Holly Williams has reported extensively on Syria, having visited the country 10 times now. Holly joins us from Istanbul uh, tonight. Holly, first of all, what does this mean for the fight against ISIS? Well, Jeff, a local official from the region in Syria where the U.S. has its bases warned us tonight that the American withdrawal could give ISIS an opportunity to regroup and come back. Now, America's partners on the ground are the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, and they now control around a quarter of Syria. And we have witnessed the SDF beat ISIS back to a few holdouts in the desert and bring relative stability uh, to the areas that they control. And that will be more difficult once those Americans American troops have gone home. And so then what about other potential consequences for the region? Well, uh, the American withdrawal could also open the door to Turkey, which has threatened to launch a military operation in SDF territory. Uh, More fighting could bring uh, more instability to the region. Uh, Also, the American withdrawal could force the SDF to embrace the Syrian regime, as well as its backers, Iran and Russia, simply to ensure their own survival. Finally, the American withdrawal could send a message uh, to other groups, both here in the Middle East and elsewhere, that the U.S. cannot be counted on to stand by its partners. Jeff. Uh, Holly, so great to get your perspective tonight. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, hold on a second. She has her conclusion at the end is that this is some sort of indication that the United States will not stand by its partners. So I'm asking in this situation in Syria, who are its partners? Well, the odds just a that- bunch of ragtag FTF, FDS guys, are ra- they're not like a nation state. They're a bunch of guys that we probably created. So who was whose partners? Well, how's this sending a bad message about us not standing by our partners? Well, interestingly, we only have one partner in the region, and that is NATO member Turkey. Yeah, there that's you our it. actual partner. Yeah. Well, Turkey's not in NATO yet. You, you know, well, what yes, I mean. they are. You're right. Sorry, are they in NATO? NATO. The yes. They're, yeah. not in, they're not in the yeah, European they're a Union. They're NATO yet. member that we have to, yeah. So we're standing by our partners if we cut it loose and let them take over. It's just so interesting that we have this incredible, so the reason why I know there's something going on is when you get Lindsey Graham, you know, uh, this still John McCain holdover, and others saying, this is crazy, we got to stay in, we got to stay in Syria, which, you know, the Congress, did. this is still under the 2001 state of emergency uh, laws yeah, that the president 9/11. can do. This, this is bullshit. We shouldn't be there, and we shouldn't be in Afghanistan. One of our producers sent a, um, a recommendation for an author. Uh, I forget the name of it in this book. I'll put it in the show notes. Need to be in Afghanistan, but the uh, well, he says that this author's if, concept. Running poppies. Well, that, it, the, his concept is that perhaps 
because shale oil production has reached its, its break-even point, that the yeah, U.S. really does not need oil from anywhere, we're going to become the biggest oil producer, that the idea is Trump is possibly letting it all go, let everyone argue it out and fight each other and kill each other in the Middle East, and we'll be completely isolated from that. Could be. It's a simple enough strategy that he would come up with it. If you know it's what I mean. not a bad strategy. No, except for the poppies. That's an issue. I mean, you got to you got poppies are the poppies. You got to I mean, protect brought, the poppies. They released those four uh, superstar uh, creeps from uh, Gitmo. Yeah. Who we initially assumed they were released for a reason, and they were the guys that were supposed to take over the poppy business. But I mean, that was our thesis. Yeah. But have they done it? I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. never never heard anything about it. But uh, do we need to still be there guarding the poppy fields or can they just run this thing without us? Well, seeing as Trump is probably not he's in a lot of business, but I don't think he's in the in the narcotics business. He, I don't may, think he so. doesn't have I don't a think, kickback. You know, I don't think he's been read in on what we're up to over he, there. He doesn't have a kickback off of that deal. So, you know, maybe the people who are protesting all these things have some uh, some other agendas that we're unaware of. What's going on? Yeah. Well, Easy money. So keep your eye on Turkey. We've always said it. I'm sure Mar- Mark Hall, uh, I, have, I have a call schedule with him. We're going to talk soon because he's he knows everything about this stuff. He's so deep in this Gulen stuff. But we'll see if we can figure out what's happening with, uh, well, with you know, Syria. Eventually, Gulen's going to die of old age. Yeah, but it, you know, it still would be very fun to to have the extradition take place and see what see the plan unfold. And... With that unfolding, they're not going to do that. I'd like to thank you for your courage and say in the morning to you, the man who put the C in digital caliphate, John C. Dvorak. Well, in the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry, and all the ships that see in boots on the ground, feet in the air, subs in the water, and all the dames and knights out there. In the morning to our illustrious trolls in the troll room. They're there on their troll poles and uh, helping out as usual. You can be a troll too. Uh, just go to noagendastream.com on Sunday or Thursdays, and you can uh, witness the show live, listen to the stream, the pre-show, and all of that goodness, and uh, you can uh, troll me. Also, in the morning to Dame Illuminadia, who brought us the extremely funny artwork for episode 1095. The title of that was Yeno, and she had our No Agenda Travel Kit, which, as you know, consists of a stick-on third eye, googly eye glasses, and a uh, terrorist beard. And she put them on, uh, I don't know, on a woman, because there were a couple yeah. of people came up with this idea, but she just had the funniest one for some reason. With well, our- I will should uh, maybe remark on the the, the runner up or the one that yeah. was the one which, that was going up against, which was Darren O'Neill's was beautiful uh, piece, which makes it look like. But the I was I think we because it, shows it, 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 that would be something we could use as an evergreen when we don't have something appropriate well, it wasn't that i don't think that one was that evergreen it was still pretty specific to the show but the uh point was it was o'neill uh falling back on his old formula we've seen it too many times with the little splash uh thing with the little plug is product for sale it is not it wasn't uniquely uh, different oh okay from- now i'm i'm talking about the uh, mike riley one the yeah no agenda which was just a beautiful piece we looked oh, at no, that that's too that's different yeah we looked no, at that i'm talking that. about the other one that's the same that was in right. the same right yeah yeah. yeah yeah he, yeah he had now only 33 33 yeah but it was and, also you know, it was good it's good if if, if, no, if it would have won even that was that it, wasn't the problem it, the problem was it was zuckerberg yeah oh that's the other one it was zuckerberg yeah we're harsh, man. People put their, their all their love into this, and we just break them down. Well, they need to know what, what we think so they can uh, psych us out. But the whole thing is the artists. That's what all artists do is they try to psych out the art editor. <laughs> oh. you know, he's going to go for this because he likes green. Uh, Nailed that's it. That's what they do. It's what your job is. <laughs> So uh, they got to they got to understand a little bit so they can psych us out. Uh, now the other the one you liked a lot, which was the big uh, just kind of a flamboyant piece. I liked it too. It was very pretty, but it could be used for a lot of things. The Mike Riley piece. Yes, it was very pretty. Anyway, no agenda art generator dot com. We appreciate the work that all of our artists do, uh, and you can go look at all of that work again. No agenda art generator dot com. And you should remember, all oh, artists should remember, a cheap laugh usually wins. Always wins. No, not usually. Not I think, always. Mm. Sometimes, we've had situations where there's a beautiful piece of art that's so well done that the cheap laugh will, will lose to it. I remember this happening a couple of times. Okay. Anyway, 
that's all the inside dope we're going to give these guys. <laughs> Let us thank some of our executive and associate executive producers who have supported. Yeah, we're starting to come in episode. at the end of the year. I'm, I'm really appreciating this personally. I'm sure Adam is too. So Sir Francis of SRQ is at the top of the list from Arcadia, Florida with $1,000. He's an insta something. Oh, this is, uh, yes, he's the one who comes in every twice a year. Uh, please accept my biannual donation for, uh, for 2018, the amount of 1000 which should be allocated as follows. <laughs> 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 Always funny when you start that way. Yeah. A seventy six fifty five will bring me to Earl status, and one twenty three dot forty five is your Christmas bonus. It has been a great year of deconstruction, and as always, I appreciate the effort and dedication that you two put into the show each week. More importantly, I cannot thank you enough for the many laughs you have provided me on a daily commute, while also providing me with invaluable information on so many topics. I wish you both a wonderful Christmas and a very happy New Year. Please play the best of Sharpton for us, and let's be sure to have some cookies and vodka at the round table for Santa today. Yes, I've already added them to the... Uh to the feast one final request i would love to hear a segment at some point on the various ways that one can listen to the show i ask because i tried a few apps in the beginning and then settle on youtube premium which allows me to listen while running other apps at all or running other apps running other apps sorry running other apps and it also saves my location to this in the stream each time it's a new feature of youtube uh, the YT channel is called April. Not sure who that is, but I wanted to say thanks to that person or bot for posting the shows. Now, adios, mofos, Sir Francis of SRQ, Earl of Southwest Florida. Well, here's a question. Is he on the upgrade list? So is, yeah, I believe so. So why why are we on YouTube Premium? Are they charging you to listen to us? Is that the idea? I presume Premium means that. Uh... I have no idea what YouTube Premium. I think YouTube Premium is the TV stuff, isn't it? The streaming. Yes, but that yeah. he he says it right there. He's list thanks to YouTube Premium. He settled on YouTube Premium. Right, YouTube. He listens. He settled on YouTube Premium, which allows me to listen while running other apps. Yeah. Does he listens to the show on YouTube Premium? Okay, in April post, I guess. What? April is the one posting. Right, it. but I don't. I mean, it's, okay. YouTube is charging money to listen to us, I guess. I don't know what's going on. I guess. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know what? Listen to it any way you want. We have the lo-fi no agenda, which I think we have. All- I think that's what he wants to know. He wants to know all the outlets and all the different ways you can listen to oh, the show. Oh, God. I don't know. Some of them I are on I think we the- should do a paper. A giblet and charge for it. <laughs> We're going to charge you to tell you how you can listen. That's it. Thanks. Good evening, to you, Ed. <laughs> is this Crown Hog Day 2? We are watching that was Attorney General Eric Holder ABDs about some Republicans at home are already beating the drums of war. Today, the Pentagon refuted that claim. <laughs> and he said the American people do not want him to quote Dwindling, he, they, they do not want him dwindling his thumbs. <laughs> you can get a gig as a court uh, contortionist, in intravenous fluids and pills coated uh, with galet, uh, gelatin. <laughs> we don't leave our women or women, women or men in uniform behind. It's a monument to the hubris of <laughs> Dick Cheney, Representative <laughs> Raul Ara, uh Labrador. The years of, abu- of abuse. I personally apologize. To Mr. Peebus, just ask <laughs> to soon to be former congressman. Democrats are outright jitty. The CIA's counter and counter tourism, counter terrorism center. <laughs> Veteran Affairs Secretary Shins, Shinsketty. Why do I always mess up his name? Shinseki. I love my critics. I have fun with that. You've got karma. Can't resist playing it, man. It's just too good. Does he say uh, Crown Hog Day? I think so, yeah. At the beginning? <laughs> yes. So I was thinking about that. I just don't, don't want to stop the flow here, but I've been meaning to discuss this, why he says jitty. Well, he, he means to say giddy. He means to say giddy, but he probably thinks it's pronounced like jiff. jiff <laughs> yes. When yeah. he reads it off the prompter. Interestingly, I've been around people 
And I'll say, oh, I'm, they got all jitty with it. And people are like, uh, you know, it's pronounced giddy. I'm like, yes. Only That's- Sharpton could make that mistake. Yeah, you can't go doing saying stuff like that. Jitty. But I'd say it now. Now it sticks and getting all jitty. And getting jitty. Getting jitty. And if well, they say, oh, hey, man, that's not the way you pronounce it. So, oh, you probably say gif too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's pronounced jif according to the guy who invented yes, the word. It's pronounced jitty according to the guy who invented the word, Al Sharpton. The word jif. <laughs> jitty is invented by Al Sharpton. That's how you pronounce well, it. Well, I'm jitty over Gene Mickoff. Parts unknown, five hundred dollars. Uh, this should be tagged to my good friend Jeffrey Marcy, which clears a small debt to him. So mm. we'll be crediting Jeffrey. Okay. Um, I'm also told it completes his long quest for no agenda knighthood, so uh-huh. he should be on the knighting list. Talk well, about a friend. <clears throat> yeah, no kidding. Well, Jeffrey now lives in the Bay Area, and thanks again for the. E1 trader karma from the prior donation, which allowed him to have a global cooling trend in Canada, no. left left the global cooling trend in Canada behind. He's not to be confused with the only other Jeffrey Marcy, the Shane Professor of Astronomy at <laughs> Berkeley. Once, <laughs> once knighted, he wants to be referred to as Sir Jeffrey B. Marcy. Yes. And hopefully this elevated status will help him avoid a precipitous fall from grace. Thanks for being one. Of the only two podcasts I religiously listen to for long-term sanity. Oh, goodness. Now I want to know what the other one is. Yeah, it's the first thing came to my mind, too. Hmm. Well, Onward. thank you very much, Gene, and congratulations, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, give us give both some karma while we're here. You've got karma. Jeffrey Johnson is uh, $338 from uh, Port Angeles, Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, ITM, gents. Excellent shows. Happy Festivus to all producers and knights. Yo. It would be Festivus miracle if JCD held a Port Angeles meetup sometime soon. I could do that. We did Seattle. It's pretty far away. We, Port Angeles, we got maybe 10 people up there. Uh, just an F cancer for my mother who has five weeks of radiation coming up. 73s. You've got... Karma. $333.33 from Anonymous. Would appreciate a thorough de douching for Carl from Ormond Beach, Florida. <laughs> You've been de oh, I'm sorry. Went a little fast. And his smoking hot wife. Oh, let me give her one too. <laughs> You've been de douched. She also needs some tennis winning karma and the Trump aliens jingle to set up the theme from the X Files. Keep up the superlative work. Whenever the president finds any aliens, okay, any aliens, or of any class of aliens. <laughs> Forgot this one. Whenever the president finds aliens. Whenever the president finds aliens. Any aliens. Or of any class of aliens. You've got karma. It's that new, ser- it's that new search program. Jam. That new search program that uh, have you seen this called Everything? No. Uh, you were on the email. Producer recommended it. It's you can get it from VoidTools.com. Holy crap! This search thing is great. It's really helping me find uh, jingles. Mm. I'll, I'll download it immediately. Open, after it's the open show. source. It's open source. Outstanding open product. Source. Yes, open source. Jo- Joseph Finley's in Louisville, Ohio, and he donated three hundred thirty-three dollars flat out. ITM episode ten ninety-five kept my sanity driving six hours to Bad Axe, Michigan. <laughs> That's in the thumb. How uh, anyhow, I found myself laughing out loud hearing John's butcher name, butcher names, only to have Potfather correct John C. Devore Jacques. <laughs> Donations are down, so we need the No Agenda Nation to do their part and chip, chip, chip in. Merry Christmas, John and Adam. I want to smack my brother David, a.k.a. dude named Ben, currently in Afghanistan, in the mouth. Uh, All he does is Ben work and exercise. He better be listening to the best podcast in the universe. Jingle request. Sharpton respect. Obama all gonna die. 
and Karma Adam Ye. R E S P I C T. You, you might die. You've got karma. Yay! Um, dropping down to associate executive producer was Sean Kunath, $217. I was hitting the mouth two years ago by my cousin and have been dragging my feet about donating. I also held off singing up, signing up for the newsletter until a week ago. The epic newsletter fail and, and my uncle's recent donations made the final push I needed to stop freeloading. The amount, 217, refers to my birthday. Uh, and I like 2 and 17, and they're both prime numbers. I'm currently having a little north of, I'm living a little north of Dallas in Louisville, Texas. I teach middle school Latin. And science at a classical school in the area, it can be surprisingly difficult, difficult due to this astounding gaps in knowledge that these students have and the various behavioral issues that crop up. I've been teaching this age for the past four years now. And from what I can tell, our educational system is in dire need of reform. It seems to me that we've lost sight of education as a way of bettering a person and expanding their mind and now see it simply as a means to an end. Mm -hmm. These middle school students and even so many young people of my generation, I'm 25, by the way, are so self-absorbed because they have become accustomed to viewing people and things from a strictly utilitarian standpoint. The questions of why are we learning this or when are we ever going to use this in life? Questions that the kids ask fail to take into account the broader picture of human the broader picture of human understanding and development learning latin is good in itself as by the way i agree with this i think people should take latin learning latin is good in itself as latin is a beautiful language with a rich history it was i was a latin major in college but practically speaking the linguistic and analytical capacity its study instills in the minds is priceless i could go on but I feel like this note is long enough and as, as is, and I'm ready, uh, hoping to be able to come to Austin for the Texas meetup. Good Hint. cold read, John. Thank you. Uh, shout out to the rest of the Kunath clan that listen and donate, including Sir Colin, the friendly fat man, George, Uncle George, Arthur, Colleen, Stefan, etc., or Stephen. I need a de-douching for my jingles. Uh, could you please play the Australian prawn song? And a drone again at the end of the show, I'd be most appreciative. You've been de-douched. Put another prawn on the bobby. Cause no one in Australia calls them shrimp. And no one here drinks that Foster's lager. Everybody knows it tastes like shit. The drone again. You've got karma. Can I just say something? Um, everyone, it's become a a thing where people are saying, "I want this song at the end of the show." I can't do that every time, and it's also you know it's kind of outside of the scope because I have stuff lined up, and it just becomes he, too long. Just without. one of the things that when he, when Adam does his preparation, he prepares the end of the show because he gets all these clips in. He doesn't want to have to deal with it during the show. Thank you. I can't. <laughs> I can't. That's it in a yeah. nutshell. Yeah. Sometimes he does. Oh, yeah. No, but, I, I, but, you know, a drone again. Usually is, if it's something extremely long and we don't have a lot of good stuff. Yes, of course. We have good stuff today. That's why. Taylor Martin, $210.96 uh, in Deutschland. In Deutschland. I'm Hello, in Deutschland, Deutschland for Christmas. So, uh, I keep a mess on the screen, but Fröhliche... Fröhliche Weihnachten. Weihnachten. I've donated before, but I've never received an official dedouching. Oh, well, we can do that. <laughs> You've been dedouched. I've listened since show 970, and I wanted to give this amount to the show value for value. Uh, I want to give this amount to the show, the value the show has given me over the past year and a half for the value. The show has been greatly has been greatly recently, and you guys have deconstructed the M5M BS well. The world is a crazy place, and it drove me insane. But after I found this is the common theme that I hope people appreciate what he's just about to say. The world is a crazy place, and it drove me insane. But after I found you guys, my mental health is ten thousand times better. Wow. 
all we're doing is explaining stories in a little more detail than the media wants to explain them because they want to manipulate you and make you buy their products advertised on their show. It's good to know that not everyone in the world is crazy like the mainstream media is. I would like a respect jingle, but this is this is a classic example of uh, there's no real reason for this uh, fractal or not fractal. Besides but, the fact uh, that it's a dynamite jingle, well, that's what it is. Dynamite jingle, but it's just interesting. It's always on the everything's in the same random number theory in play. Uh, I got ants. The intro to I got ants and some Christmas goat. Goat karma for all. Yes. Um, we're doing the intro, John. That's why. Hit it now. I got ants. I got ants. R-E-S-P-I-C-T. You've got <laughs> karma. On point today. Sir Timothy of the No Fix title will be a... Uh, another associate executive producer from Plymouth, Michigan, probably in local one, I think. Uh, for Adam to read, R- Adam, read. Oh, then I can't do the jingles. Yuletide greetings to Adam, John, and all No Agenda producers. No greetings whatsoever to those who have never donated. I am donating at Christmas to support the glittering, multifaceted gem that is No Agenda. Here's why I've gotten so much value recently. One, converge of events. Coverage coverage of events and media outside the U.S. I like news from other countries besides my own. Two, legislative analysis both inside and outside the U.S. And three, blistering mockery of authoritarians both on the right and the left. Please continue travels abroad in 2019. I'd like this John to spend some time in Russia. We've been trying to get that motherfucker to Russia for a long time. And Adam in the U.K., Merry Christmas. Please play Kevin Anders' parody of Night Moves with his fake news song, plus Michelle Obama scaring little kids in a disturbing psycho monster voice. <clears throat> yes. You remember the, 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 the Michelle one? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I've got that one. And what was the other one he wanted? I don't know this one. The yeah, I do. Moves, I, night yeah, moves. fake news. Let me see. Fake news. Okay, it's maybe. been a while since we've used that one. And that's Sir Timothy of the No Fix title in Plymouth. And, oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Go, go. Yes, here's a little one. You come on up. <laughs> you cursed brat. Look what you've done. I'm melting. Melting. Oh, come on. Come on. Writing up some fake news. Trying to get cheap clicks and top page views <laughs> Writing up some fake news Oh, it's propaganda time <laughs> You've got karma <laughs> when, Let me see, when did we, when was that jingle created? Let me see, that is from, yeah, 2016 huh. Dwight Chick in Burlington, Ontario, $201.20 it has taken me a few years of listening to the best podcast in the universe, uh, and I have finally reached the rank of knighthood. I would like to thank my brother. I think he's on the list. I'd like to thank my brother, Sir Hank Scorpio, for hitting me in the mouth all those years ago. After Sunday's episode and hearing the children reading their scripts about how they are terrified about climate change, I could not stop <laughs> laughing and needed to donate. I think our point was that it's horrible and child abuse. But I'm glad you got a kick out of it. <laughs> we, apparently some people took yeah. it as raw comedy. Yeah, there you go. Who knew? Now, uh, for my official title, I couldn't think of anything fancy. Just Dwight the Knight. I like that, actually. It's, it's nice. Sir Dwight the Knight. It's fantastic. And I would like to request at the round table, T. Earl Grey Hot. Ah. You, you know what that reference is? Uh, is, that, uh, is that a James Bond reference? No, Picard. Oh. I'm not a, I'm not a star. 32. Yeah. T. Earl Grey Hot. Shouldn't you say computer? T. Earl Grey Hot. I think it was the replicator, not the computer that he talked to. I can almost smell and taste. I shouldn't know these things. Yeah. No, I should know them. Everyone should. No, I, I can almost smell and taste the feast. I will be looking forward to my nighting ceremony later on in the program. If I could get the No Agenda National Anthem at the end of the show, it would be great. We could maybe do that in one of the shows. Why don't, we do, why don't we do it now? We never. We rarely the ever. The whole National Anthem? It's 30 seconds. <sighs> oh, okay. oh it's, Sharpton was a minute. No complaints there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please. 
please rise for your Gitmo Nation National Anthem. And you may sing along. In the morning, Gitmo Nation, we are all charged up to be human resources and service in all lands and all ships and seas. Stand in attention. From the east to west, down under to the lowlands and beyond. We are happy and distracted slaves. Here are Gitmo Nation songs. I, I, I cannot tell you how disappointed I am that you took a knee during that, John. <laughs> I did not take a knee. That was <laughs> Fernando de los Reyes, Reyes, Reyes in Sierra Vista, Arizona, 200. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's. Uh, keep up the good work. And thank you very much Aaron for your Fernando. courage. Okay. Sir Keith of the Fayette. Fayette. Fayette Nam. Fayette. Vietnam. Vietnam. Ah, that's right. I remember that. Uh, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, consider this a Merry Christmas donation. Simply put, keep up the good work and... Uh, Best wishes have- for the new year. Thank you very much for your courage, Sir Keith of Vietnam. And last but not least is our fabulous Dame Patricia of Biscayne Bay. And I have to run and get her note. Okay. Oh, so... It- Squirrel mail is not appropriate at this point, or it is. Do you print it? Mm, I don't know, man. Uh, Okay, well, it's warranted. But guess what? What? So I went to Mark Perkel's kind of a uh, celebration of of his life. The death thing, you know, it's a yes. Place, the, like, it's, it's your no. I never get spam guy who passed away. Yes. Hold yeah. on. Hold on one second. You can't. You got to have the end of the jingle. Hit it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he. So he passed away, which yeah, sucks. Yeah, but guess who I got to meet? Oh, is this really a guessing game? I can. The inventor of squirrel mail. No. Yep. Who is he? Who is this mysterious masked man? He calls himself Paul. And uh, did you tell him of your affectation, your affection for uh, the squirrel yeah, males? He, did he like it? Did he like what? Did he, like, he loves it. Did he like that you were using it, that, that the show actually, that the entire back office of the No Agenda show <laughs> runs squirrel on squirrel mail. mail. I mean, this is, hopefully you mentioned that to him in passing. I, I did. I tried to, <laughs> but he's kind of, a, you know, he's like a guy. That, first of all, you have to imagine a really tall, bald guy. Who invented squirrel mail, and then project <laughs> on him what you think his sense of humor would be like if I gave this discussion to him. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I got you. I got you. Nail it. Yeah. Um, Dame Patricia Worthington. She sent a beautiful card, as she often I wish does. We get more cards from some of our people, uh, and she always sends a card. We got two cards. That's all we got so far. Uh, I mean, to, in this last mailing, wishing you both a merry Christmas and a happy, prosperous New Year. I decided to send my accounting to give. Myself a Christmas present of a new title. Get your pen out because I did not send this to Eric. Oh, hold on a second. So this is Dame Patricia Worthington. Go. If I thought there was a protectorate that would ensure that South Florida carry out an election without being a laughing stock, I would ask for it. As it is, I think I'll just stick with Biscayne Bay. Thank you for being an important part of my daily life and keeping me uh, on even keel. Karma for my kids, please. And then she sends a... Hold on, uh, I just need to understand something. So what is the type, what what peerage well, level is she at now? Uh, she's at, okay, I have to go to the peerage thing, and I'll tell you. Which, by the way, is officially called the peerage thing. That's the peerage page, actually. <laughs> the, the peerage you page. You mock these things. I, you, you have very little respect. You need to keep it open, because I have this, something for the peerage committee. I take it very seriously. Mm-hmm. I just love that it's also being run on squirrel mail. I believe it's peerage.htm. <laughs> and she will be a <laughs> Viscountess. Viscountess of Biscayne Bay? Biscayne Bay, yeah. Okay, she was got... Baroness, and now she and she could have expanded her her, her purview, but she decided uh, to just keep it. 
I'm going to give her karma in a moment. We do have... Well, actually, I need to give her karma first. Thank you, Dame uh, Patricia. For her, You've got for her kids. karma. For her kids. There's a... Uh, I got a note for the peerage committee from Sir Corwin Underwood. Yes, I saw this note. You may read it. Uh, dear John, uh, chairman of the peerage committee, I recently achieved the status of Baron. The protectorate I tried to claim was all Southwest Ohio, and it was disputed by another fellow Baron from Ohio, <laughs> Sir Lady Fingers of Miami Valley. I had a feeling my territorial claim was a little too ambitious. Therefore, I will respect the rights of Sir Lady Fingers and humbly request a gerrymandering of the district to allow me to claim the protectorate of the southwest tri-county area of Ohio to include Butler, Hamilton, and Warren counties. The Miami Valley is a vast area that runs along a very long river that passes through both Butler and Hamilton counties and flows into the Ohio River. However, residents further south on the Great Miami River don't consider themselves part of the Miami Valley. I have a feeling Sir Lady Fingers is a little bit further north where residents do refer to the area as the Miami Valley. Even so... Sir Lady Fingers can have the Miami Valley through those respective counties, and my subjects and I will steer far away from the river area and will remain in the outlining county areas. I seek a ruling from the Peerage Committee in this regard. Respectfully, Sir Corwin Underwood. This has uh, been looked over, and it's granted with the proviso that Sir Lady Fingers has 30 days to. Uh, to dispute it? To refute. <laughs> and, yeah, to dispute the this finding uh, after 30 days, it's final. <laughs> order! Order in the court! <laughs> wow, great. Okay, well, that's taken care of. Good, 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 good. Every, everything's, although, of course, we do encourage barons and their, and their subjects to cooperate. Meet to meet up, yeah, cooperate with each other. You know, it's, it's, you're supposed to all kind of be in the same boat. So we'll see so how that, that goes. That concludes our list of executive and associate executive producers for show 1096. I want to thank each and every one of them for helping us produce this show and, uh, and, and for the nice cards. Yes. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Happy Hanukkah. Are we done with Hanukkah? Is it done? I think we're done. Um, I, um, I don't, yeah. I can't say that I know. And would like to thank everybody uh, for this uh the support of the program, part of our value for value system, you determine what the show is worth to you, how much value you've received in your life. And in return, um, you receive a credit in this case in the upper echelons. Uh, these are actual credits that can be used anywhere credits are recognized in the entertainment business or elsewhere. And we will also be thanking more people in our second segment, $50 and above. And again, thank you for your courage. And remember, another show coming up on Sunday. Dvorak.org. Slash and you've got some deconstruction to take with you into the weekend when it comes to new knowledge, so propagate. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. Shut up. Whoa. Order. 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 Shut up, slave. Did you hear about the person of the year according to the Financial Times? Another person of the year, not the same computer or the uh, protesters or, or the dead journalist person of the year? No, that's Time Magazine. Yeah, okay, there's another one? The, I thought well, there was only one person of the year, it's Time Magazine. Well, Time Magazine used to count. <clears throat> now everyone's getting into the game. Financial Times has selected George Soros as its person of the year. Congratulations, George. <laughs> <laughs> Something about that. The, you know, I, I th yeah, the Financial Times is obviously a globalist publication. So I, oh. I see the humor in what they're doing. I, I think it's a little wink. You know? Hey. <laughs> hey, boys. Try this one out for size. <laughs> okay, I've been... So, uh, yeah, go ahead. I got it. So I want to get this out of the way. I was in the newsletter. I discussed it a little bit. Tucker Carlson uh, was uh, attacked. You know, they're trying to get him off the air because he's a nuisance. Oh, he, well, no, no. He's not. He's a... Uh, white nationalist, racist, uh, Nazi quadroon, to be exact. Well, let's listen to what Democracy Now! has to say about him. In media news, more than a dozen companies have pulled advertisements from the program Tucker Carlson tonight after the Fox News host said immigrants make the U.S. poorer, dirtier, and more divided. Carlson made the comment on his primetime show last Thursday. 
We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor, they tell us, even if it makes our own country poorer and dirtier and more divided. Following an uproar over the comment, companies including Land Rover, IHOP, Pacific Life Insurance, Ancestry.com, and Just for Men have pulled ads from Carlson's show. Fox News has accused left-wing groups of censoring Carlson's program and noted the advertisers have only shifted their sponsorship to other Fox News programs. Censoring? Did he really accuse them of censoring? Is that what he accused them of? I don't know who's but this nonsense. Well, but I happen but the to- point is, is that we. this is one of the things that our listeners should pay attention to I wrote about in the newsletter and of course they have the entire clip uh, linked so you can go listen to right it's 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 out of context pretty much because he was talking to some some dude in Tijuana and and they were specifically talking about the trash that was left behind from the caravan or that's yeah. that's been been created by the caravan, and that's yeah, dirty. that's where the dirty. Ca- but I saw Dershowitz on his show yesterday, and Dershowitz launched. I should have clipped it really. Dershowitz I saw it too. launched. I saw it's it. like my my parents were called dirty, as in dirty Jews. But holy crap, that thing took a life of its own. Yeah, I mean, not I don't care what you think of Tucker Carlson, but that's out of context. Solely out of context. The whole thing was out of context. They were just looking to get him because he's a nuisance. To the left, He's Nazi quadroon. Doing, I don't know. He's a it's nuisance. Just, I find to it the very left. annoying. But this is classic example—a classic example of advertisers knuckling under. And by the way, the people that started doing this before anybody else was the right wingers. The right wingers that you know these these mostly a bunch of religious people that form some groups and they oh, oh you totally. can't put that on TV. Yes, it's you're right. Ruin the kids. That's right. Go for years. We grew up with that. It yeah. was the ultimate. It wasn't political correctness. It was just correctness. Um, yeah. Now, this does play into the purge. And I want to just to discuss this briefly as there was a, a lot of people emailed me this uh, YouTube video. You saw it, I'm sure, <clears throat> uh, of um, Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson. Uh, I linked it in the newsletter. Okay, good. Um who are leading the charge on the Patreon purge. And in this case, uh, they are trying to get everyone to leave Patreon. A lot of people are leaving it. Well, uh, Well, let me just finish. And then, yeah, there are, there's some big names who have left Patreon. And here's what I found interesting is that Jordan Peterson apparently is working on his own initiative uh, for a payment system for creators. And I would like to say, Jordan Peterson, that is the stupidest idea you've had. Stay far away from it. Do not, <laughs> do not do this. It will distract you from what you're doing. It will become a huge headache. It will be a massive failure. It will be an embarrassment. An embarrassment. Thank you. It is not something you want to do. Ultimately, here's, here's my recommendation. It's not frictionless. But you can get from, I think, Coinbase, you can get a Bitcoin Visa card. And so you, you, you hand out your Bitcoin uh, wallet address. Yes, people have to find out how they get Bitcoin to pay you with it. And then they send you the Bitcoin, it shows up on your debit card, and then you can spend it right away. That's no good. It's the only, Bitcoin is the only option left if, for, after people get deep platform. They've been, payment systems have been screwing over we webcam girls use any pot of these shops we use paypal and the banks yeah but i know john we're not controversial nor are we no if someone gets pissed off about us then we'll have the same problem bro i don't know about that bro yeah i think i think you do know about that my point is we're not like these guys we're doing something different but if we became a problem enough then someone could easily look wikileaks Deplatformed by PayPal, MasterCard, years ago. This is nothing new. But they're idiots if they think, oh, oh, I've got some technology and well, it'll be fantastic. No. No, I no. thought, I th- well, there's two things you have to think about. One, Jordan Peterson makes a lot of money on Patreon. He has not been deplatformed. No, I didn't say he was. No, I know, but he's acting as though he's going to be any second when it's not going to happen. So this nonsense. So he's like, you know, him and Ruben are making a big scene and they're promoting their tour. I thought the whole thing was so commercial listening to him. And then to think that there's a thing called core competencies that is a kind of a mantra in the Silicon Valley. And it's one I, it's one I subscribe to. There's certain things you can do and there's certain things you can't do. And you try to partner with people that are, cover your weaknesses and they cover your weakness, I, you know, back and forth. That's what we do on the show. And 
Jordan Peterson is a superb speaker, professor, a guy can, can make money off books, a best-selling writer, and he has all these – he has to leverage that. He's not an entrepreneur. No. Has he ever been an entrepreneur? Has Dave Rubin ever been an entrepreneur at the level that we're talking about here, the Patreon guys? No. 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 So you're just going to fall into a hole, just what you said, fall into a hole. And it's going to – you're never going to dig your way out of it. It's a nightmare. To, to do this unless it's your job. Yeah. And neither one of these guys, that neither one of them, that's not their job. Ruben is an interviewer and he likes to put together these shows. He's a producer. He's a t- broadcasting type guy. And Peterson's a professor, prof- professorial guy. You just can't. And we've seen this over the years, especially if you're around this area. Well, here, here's an example. Scott Adams. Take that as your example. Scott Adams has been pushing his app and it's and no one knows what it does. It doesn't work. It works. It's it's it is because uh, this is not what he does. Scott Adams isn't even the best example. The best example is Al Gore. No, how about Adam Curry's Podcaster Pro? How about that as an example? That's not a very good example because you've done a lot of little companies and you're always tinkering. You're like an old retired guy. <laughs> you tinker, tinker, tinker. <laughs> this is a core competency of yours. So no. That doesn't count. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you. I feel better now about that myself. That it was ripped off completely. <laughs> and they it's haven't sent a compliment. And they haven't sent me a demo unit. That's the I egregious don't think part. They made copy number one yet. I think that whole thing is a, no, no, no. A, I, there's a guy from no. They're demoing it on on YouTube. There's about twenty videos showing how it works. Okay. Well, I don't think they're in massive production. They should be giving us both a copy. Yeah, a copy. But <laughs> Just the point a, is, a copy. is that the. Uh, these two guys are living in a dream world if they think they're going to go off and create a competitor to Patreon. Exactly. Which was not a good idea to start with. And I will remind everybody. when Actually, we, we don't even like Patreon, so why would you want to make a copy? No, when we, when we started uh, NoAgendaSocial.com, a Mastodon instance, as it's known in the hip marketing language of nerds, was that a year and a half ago now, at least? Two years, maybe. Maybe two years. Um, so, oh, the fuck was my point? You were talking about okay. Yeah, please. T- I'm, your I'm last few words on this one because I can't remember what you. What, what did we? Say. What did you just say? I said that we didn't even like Patreon. Oh, okay. I remember. So when we started NoAgendaSocial.com, dot com, what happened was, uh, you know, of course, a couple of producers started engaging um, with social justice warriors on you know the big mastodon dot com or whatever, and you know they were harassing them, you know, in in a fun no agenda way. But, you know, triggering the social justice warriors, which you can do on Mastodon because, you know, it's not Twitter. You won't get deplatformed. Well, what happened is we got on all the banned and blocked and silence lists, which I'm quite proud of. I mean, literally mentioned as free speech zone. Be careful. Free speech zone. Nazi quadroons. And the curry is a harasser. And the harassment consisted of the following. The woman who was complaining, um, she had a Patreon. She was promoting her Patreon. So I went over there. And I supported her Patreon with like 10 bucks or whatever. Why? No, 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 nothing. Just to be able to follow what she was doing. Immediately, I got an email uh, from the um, from the crisis tyranny action team at Patreon who said, ah, no good. You're blocked from ever uh, talking to her, ever posting, ever giving money. And I knew right then it's been taken over by social justice warriors who have a Patreon to sell their macrame and whatever they do. It's not for big media outlets. It's not for someone who wants to have a career in podcasting, which by itself is funny to say. <laughs> now, a couple other purge it things. It can be done. A couple other purge things. Big article in the New York Times. I'm going to have to defend Facebook or FS Book on this one. They, uh, the New York Times touted that, oh, Facebook gave your data to Apple. I have a clip. Oh, good, because I oh, thank you. Uh, where is it? Uh, face bag and data, data giveaway. Yeah. Companies like Microsoft, Spotify, Amazon, Netflix were given access to far more Facebook users' data than even Cambridge Analytica, the British <laughs> PR firm that <laughs> collected the data of 87 million Bullshit. Americans in a bid to sway the 2016 presidential election for Donald Trump. The data sharing appeared to violate terms of a 2011 consent agreement with the Federal Trade Commission on user privacy. Now, the way this has been presented by the New York Times, also by Carlson last night, is horrible. 
And everyone's like, holy shit, they violated my privacy. That took a... In general, what this is about is stuff you wanted and you liked. Because your phone asked you, hey, would you like me to add your face bag friends to your contact or your address book? And you went, yes. That's where you consented to it. Hey, would you like to have this, be able to share this tweet through uh, email or connect to face bag? And you said, yes. Hey, would you like to see what your friends are doing when they're searching on Bing? And you said, yes. So it's really a misrepresentation. Well, it's also a misrepresentation of the way you just presented it. <laughs> okay. All right. These you- are EULA-like situations. For example, I wrote a whole column on this. That's why it just triggered me. Mm-hmm. Is that Google, for example, if you want to use their maps, which you may have to actually use to get from point A to point B in some strange area, you have to consent to giving Google everything. Yes. Access to the microphone, access to your camera. It's, uh, the list goes on for a month. It goes on and on and on. All your contacts, yeah. everything you've ever your True. messaging. True. And you have no choice. If you say, no, I don't want to give you all this crap. You don't need any of it. And you don't. You don't need Excuse, excuse it, me. Th- excuse me. me. Map. That's exactly what I said. I said you wanted it and you liked it. You didn't want it. <laughs> you didn't That's want to I'm use saying. maps. You didn't want to use maps. No, I wanted to use the maps, but I didn't want to give them all these powers. Oh no, over I me. understand that. But but, but the, yeah, but the way you present it is as though the person gladly volunteered. No, yes, they, they did. did. Nobody gladly volunteers for anything. This is a scam. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're both right. What, did you write a column about this? Where'd you write about this? It was on PC Magazine about, I don't know, six, seven months ago. By the way, I just wanted to mention, when just briefly deplatforming. You know, you were actually deplatformed from PC Magazine for yeah. something you did. So it's not I like... I never thought of it that way, but that's great. It's not like it's out of the realm, the thank you troll room. It's not like it's out of the realm of possibilities. Now, one last thing. This is insider info. One of our millennials is connected to a Google content reviewer which apparently pays pretty well. You can sit at home a couple hours a day. They're talking six, $700 a week in just reviewing content that is uploaded and submitted to Google. What I never realized is that when you say, hey, Google, or what is it? Is it okay, Google? What is the trigger word these days? Okay, Google, I think. No, I think it's, it. I think it's hey, Google now. Hey, that, Google now. That is also reviewed by content reviewers. And apparently, there's a lot of conversations that the content reviewers are privy to because these things, the, the mic opens up and it just stays open, sometimes four or five minutes, and they hear entire conversations between people. That's cool. Okay, Google. <laughs> it's very... I don't want people to be flocking to this job. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, it sounds better than this gig. I can't wait. Well, the eavesdropping is something that people enjoy. <laughs> During the year, I have to tell this story. It's kind of disgust- I just disgusting. Oh, sorry. Oh, Maybe nice. I'll save it for later. No. Nope. The show needs it now. So during the era of uh, analog cell phone conversations, you could get a scanner. <laughs> you could get a scanner. And actually, the one you get was a famous one. It was a Radio Shack scanner. Yeah, I remember. And, and, and you just had to solder. One one resistor or diode, I think it was, and then you meet. And of course, the back would never fit on again of your scanner. It would- <laughs> no, no, it fit on fine. Oh, mine me. fell you off. Soldered it on, put the thing back together, and then all of a sudden the display, everything changed, and now it was a cell phone scanner. Yeah, it was great. So apparently, the 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 um, circuit was already in there for scanning cell phones. So so you could turn it on. This was, I think. At the time, so many years ago, I don't remember. I was at MTV. Days. I remember having it in the car, right. driving home, listening to people on their cell. You usually only hear one side of the conversation sometimes. No, I always had, we, I got both. Okay. But it was and fantastic. So, so there's two, there's a couple of things I came away with. The main thing that was the phone was that this era, the phone was being used for was, were guys calling their mistresses. Yep. Girlfriends, just yep. Before they got home from hey, work. Hey, baby. Hey, baby, yeah. Yeah, can't wait to see you this that they can't be with them tonight because they have to go and stay with the old lady and you know but they're thinking <laughs> the of them, ball and, you know, and chain them. and so uh, that was number one number two was uh 
dumb idiots, and this is before Google Maps, calling their secretary around noontime asking where the restaurant is because they can't find it. And the third one were drug deals. <laughs> and there were tons of drug deals. Yeah. So so I'm like, I'm act, I, I, when I was a kid, we had a party line. So it's kind of like it built into my DNA to listen in on these things. I feel bad about it. I should work for one of the spy agencies. Anyway, I felt bad about it, but I, I did this anyway because we would I would record some of these conversations and we'd play them at parties. <laughs> Were there so, drugs at these parties? <laughs> no, nah, not that I can remember. <laughs> so the one that was the worst was this guy calling his his bear dad, his you know his his gay dad, kind of this guy and his dad. And he's going on with the, talking to, to the guy, telling him how, you know, he's got to get turned on. You got to get me all turned on because my girlfriend's coming over. <laughs> and it was like such an EU moment. This guy was gay and he was talking to some other gay guy who was getting them all worked up. So when his girlfriend came over, he'd be worked up, pre-worked up so that she'd think that he was not gay because <laughs> he was already aroused when she shows up. And I just thought this was the most disgusting, heinous thing I've ever heard. And it, I still think I have the tape. If I ever find it, oh. which is, I think I still have the tape. And if I ever find it, I'll post it. Well, that's not I'm that sure disgusting. The of limitations did, is over did, for did your head explode from this? It's, it I seems was like makes you want to throw up. It was very yeah. nauseating. Yeah, I think you had to kind of hear it to, to be oh. that nauseated Made by it. it. Bad. It was hearing it was like... Every, plenty for a bunch of people and everybody's jaw dropped and it was dead silence what what there's gay guys with girlfriends and, all, and everybody said the same thing after the tape was over was it was the following line <laughs> everybody said it that poor girl ah. everybody said that of course <laughs> yeah find that tape Ebola. I have figured something out We've been looking at the Ebola scare. Yeah. Once again, now in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a lot of stuff has been going on. We're just waiting for troops to be sent in. This is usually what happens with Ebola when it was in West Africa. We sent in troops and uh, no one, it was not really all the thing that it turned out to be. They're trying to, really trying to push the meme to get the, get something going so people will be behind sending troops in. Uh, although I'm not sure if it's going to be U.S. troops. Listen to this. We are entering the world of Ebola, where no faint heart dares tread. It is a world of pain and pity. With our camera carried by their medical team, the hell and is through this layers guy, of John later- Dunn? Uh, I think he's, uh, this is on CNN. Okay. Excellent protective plastic. MSF offers as best it can a human touch. Uh, MSF, Médicins Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Borders, they usually show up in these types of uh, operations. And care for the desperately ill. It is a highly contagious virus that can strip its victims of dignity. Some arrive already so cons- I, I would say not just your dignity, it can strip you of your insides, but okay, if that's how you want to position it. Some arrive already so consumed by Ebola that it might be too late to save them. Doctors are trying experimental drugs, untested in clinical trials, because there's no alternative. Still, the death rate is more than 50%. The world has never been better prepared and armed with a battery of new drugs, better equipped to combat this disease, and yet Ebola continues to confound every prediction and every projection. Since August, this outbreak has rolled through the jungles of northeast Congo and has now arrived in Batembo, a ramshackle city of a million people. So I stopped the report there because that's where I said, hold on, what is this ramshackle place of a million people? Why is this being mentioned? This is Nord Kivu. What's, what, what's the name of it? Botenko? Well, it, it's the province of Nord Kivu. Uh, N-O-R-D, or you could say North Kivu, Kilo India Victor Uniform. Huge amounts of minerals, gold, and diamonds are extracted from North Kivu. Ah. This is the, num- the number one place in the DRC. 
For, I'm reading from this. For a decade, the province of North Kivu has been continuously facing challenges related to security. Uh, operations that have been launched continue. Uh, murders, massacres, abduction, kidnapping uh, of citizens. Uh, <clears throat> 400 people have been reported killed this year. This is all about the extraction of whatever is in the ground. And of course, it's it's nothing but fitting that you... But the number one place in the DRC in North Kiva where this happens is the people are dirt poor. And this is where all of our wealth comes from. For your cell phone as well, by the Mostly way. Mostly cell phones. Cell phones. Well, the diamonds and gold is also a part of it. Well, cell phones, it goes in there too. Uh, not diamonds, but gold. But here's, here's what I've, I've been reading up on something called the EU Africa or the Africa EU Partnership, which I'd never yeah, heard of before. A roll today. Have you ever heard of the Africa EU Partnership? I have actually. I had not, and this is something that started in 2004. It's a tangible commitment to peace and security between the EU and the African Peace sure. Facility, uh, dedicated more than $2.7 billion to support African efforts in conflict prevention and management. Yeah. Take, take this for a second. Keep the Chiners out. Well, the Chiners, no, I don't think so. Here's, okay. what, here's what I see happening. I see... No, there's about five different spots in Africa that are being built up by the Chinese with just beautiful buildings. Some have uh, resorts, beaches, you know, fantastic work. And the Chinese are taking most of the most of the minerals and whatever needs to be mined. But what I it, it, this may just be off. What struck me is what if the EU really wants this partnership? Why do they want the partnership so that they can help shepherd in these great new places? Where the elites of Europe are going to go live. They're all going to move there. They already have, you know, if you look at who's living in South Africa, if you look at who's living in Mozambique, if you look all around Africa, the elites all have homes there. And these are now being built into beautiful resort areas by the Chinese. And what's interesting is the poor people of Africa are moving to Europe. <laughs> so it's kind it's of this, a switcheroo. It is. It's like let all the, the the shitheads we don't need in Africa let them come live here. We got our beaches set up it down down there. It seems like that's a possibility. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, just a thought. It's a little too uh, unstable, it seems to me, for the elites to really want to spend a lot of time. That's Paraguay, I could see it. Um, like Mozambique. It's like the Dutch uh, king and queen have houses there. So it's, yeah. this is all yeah. over the place. Well, maybe it's a backup pl- place to go. <laughs> I think that generally speaking, the elites want to go they end up in Gestadt or Zug. I know. That's, I think that's passe. That's where they go for winter sports. That's where they go there. They go to Kstadt and Zuk and wherever else to to ski and to hang out. Davos. <laughs> yes, well, Davos is going on right now. And the, the, the sanctioned Russians who are not supposed to come in, I guess the Magnitsky Act Russians uh, were blocked initially. Uh, and now they're all uh, approved. Of course. Yeah, come on and in. They got a bunch of cash. In. And just before we uh, before we take our, before we take our break, I did want to make mention of this GoFundMe that has been set up by Brian Colfage. Um, he is a Purple Heart veteran, triple amputee, and I'm pretty sure this is legit. And he set up a GoFundMe uh, titled "We the People Will Fund the Wall," and the goal is one billion dollars. <laughs> and I will say, in three days. I'm looking at the campaign now. They've raised $5.7 million just from people contributing, from 94,000 people. Huh. Now, this is interesting. How come we can't get 94,000 people to contribute so we get $5.7 million? What are we doing wrong? We don't have a... A, a wall? Well, <laughs> we don't have a wall to build? on Facebook. Right. That's what we're doing wrong. But and and I I love the idea of this, but I think people underestimate how much a billion is. Yeah, I think so. Because when you get when you get it's to, a million million. Yeah, you know, it's like no, it's a thousand million. Well, okay. Well, it depends. In European, it used to be a million. million. No, that no, a billion in the Germanic languages is uh, indeed a gajillion. <laughs> I 
I don't know what it is. But these are these are numbers we don't have to deal with anyway. Ever. I'm gonna show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. Oh yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, on No Agenda. In the morning. No, but we do okay. I mean, I think we we provide a service that is valuable. More That's valuable. A- well, I don't know if it'd be as valuable as the wall, but the wall would be valuable. Although it could be just a wall to keep us in. <laughs> Maria, Maria. <laughs> always got to think of it that way, too. I agree. Yep. Always yep, yep, yep. Maria Patricia Lim, $100. Sir John, no, these are the people we want to thank. We're thanking them. Sir John, no, I don't have her location. Sir John Knowles, Baron of Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro has a baron. And it's his birthday today. Oh, on the, on the birthday. 20, no, on the 22nd. Yeah. On the 22nd. Well, that's okay. He's, yeah, on, the he's list, on the list. Yep, he's on the list. 8008. Sir Dave Pugh in Massillon, Ohio. 8008. Seth Anderson. 8008. You know, I put the, these uh, Easter eggs on the various newsletters with 8008. Yeah. Nobody sees them. But then I'd put nothing and I get a bunch of 8008s. It's like you want some Explain boobs, you don't get it. But, well, the thing is, Robin, when you're not looking for boobs, that's when they show up. Gary Blatt, 6660. Uh, Donald Napier. 6660. Hmm. Nicholas Robinson, small boob, 6006 in Somerville, Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, also, Alan Vivish in Trowbridge, UK, uh, 6006. Need some F cancer karma for his mom and his dad, so we'll make sure you take care of that. that yeah, yeah. For sure. Bob Wales, 58. This is interesting. He says, I'm 58 today. You're on the list. And after getting a phone call from Sir Chris Will- Wilson down there in Australia, Chris Wilson, if you've never heard him, at the end of the show, he does a lot of great songs. We have one today as well. He is the um, Michael Bublé of uh, of Australia. There's a Sydney meetup brewing. Good. And Chris will be singing. Bring your guitar, Chris. <laughs> yes. Going to be request night. Thank you very much. Dean Roker, 5510 UK. Amanda West in Minneapolis, 5510. Sir Bob of the Dude's Name Ben, High Point, North Carolina, 5510. Axel Paul, 55. Thanks for keeping my sanity. By the way, Sir Bob, the NC4RG, 73s. Yes, yeah, 73s, Sir, Kilo 5, Alpha Charlie, Charlie. Sir Chris Sundberg in Mercer Island, Washington. He also sent a nice, that was a check and a very nice card saying, uh, uh, Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. So I, we got two cards. He's got the second card. Now the following up oh, with, with Shannon Atkins, fifty fifty. Keep it up, Mofos. Jonathan Evans, fifty fifty. Donald Ripple in Dresden, Ohio. Oh, I'm sorry. It was Donald Ripple in Dresden, Ohio that sent the card oh. with fifty thirty three in it? And I wanted to thank him for the card. Sir Chris did not send a card. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> now the, fo- the following people. Bad. Uh, our $50 donor. It's not a big list today, by the way. It's not that big. Uh, gave $50 or more. I'm giving name and location if, apo- if applicable. Scott Lavender, our buddy. I think no, it's Sir Scott no, Lavender. No, it's That's a different one. Oh. You're thinking Cal. Oh, okay. This is the Montgomery, Texas Scott Lavender. Yes, yes, yes. How can you have two people with the same name? Because, like uh, because the guy's name is Cal, not Scott. Oh, this is Cal. <laughs> no, this is Scott Lavender. It has nothing to do oh, with it. <laughs> I see. You're thinking of lavenderblossoms.org, which is Cal's operation and the official CD, CBD supplier of the show. Uh, okay. I think we're – okay. Scott Lavender in Montgomery, Texas uh, could get a lot more mileage if he changed his name to Cal. That's what happens. <laughs> getting saying. chicks are in your future. Uh, Brad Taylor in Duval, Washington, 50. Eric Wilka, 50. Uh, uh, Sir Andrew Gusick, Gusick in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, George Wuchet, I believe, in Universal City, Texas. He keeps sending me how to pronounce his name. It's W-U-I-C-H-E-T. I I think it's Wuchet. Uh, Jason Ron in Ship Bottom, New Jersey. I love the name of that town. It's Uh right up there. Yep. Ship Bottom. I live in Ship Bottom. Alex Simkus. uh, Dolet Zangusen. Zangusen in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, Joel DeRuin. In Savannah, Georgia, Sir Davy of the Sooner State, obviously in Oklahoma, uh, Trey Ehrenberger in Ames, Iowa, Sir Corbin Underwood, 
Sir, or sorry, James Crane in Missouri City, Texas. Is there Missouri City in Texas? I'm sure. Why? I'm sure. Why? Why? <clears throat> and last but not least, Sir Jerry Ringenroth, who comes in constantly from Saugus, California, a very a scene of a terrible uh, story that murder somebody in Saugus. Anyway, a way to end I want on to thank an all these note. folks for helping us on 1096. Yes, yeah, so was for them we wouldn't be doing the show. And we also thank everyone who came in under fifty dollars. Just as important, uh, although we don't mention anything above fifty for brevity, but also for an, uh, anonymity. And we really appreciate everyone who's on our subscriptions. Remember, we do have another show coming up on Sunday. I do have um, a make good here <clears throat> from Surveilled of Nebraska Nuts. Uh, let's see, I donated a hundred dollars back on the first of December. Show ten ninety one and requested some house selling karma. While you and John did talk about how I was surveilled of Nebraska nuts formerly on the show, I moved to Elgin, Illinois. My karma was missed. The house selling process has been a little slow, and I could use a much needed karma shot in the arm. Can you help a knight or a baronet out? Brian Hertziger surveilled of Nebraska nuts. Now, I just wanted to explain again. That this is, our producers came up with this. We have never, you know, all we know is that when people ask for karma for jobs is where I think it started. It seems to work and maybe it's some network effect with a lot of people listening to it. I don't know, but I do want you to report back surveilled of Nebraska nuts and let us know if the house selling karma works. You've got karma. And then an emergency karma health request from Paul Couture. Uh, we all know Paul. Uh, he has done a lot for the show. He is. Uh, he calls him. What are you? Are you writing a book? Are you reading a book? The pages are very loud. I'm just proving that I'm here. Go on. He, I was actually looking for the Paul Couture note. I have it. Uh, he bills no. himself as the lazy art generator guy. Well, noagendaartgenerator.com is still running. We're very appreciative of it. He says the better half of the art gener- generator family has been in the ICU since Monday. And regardless of superstition, I firmly believe that positive thoughts can make a difference. And any and all of those would be greatly appreciated because I have no clue how I could get by without her. So, of course, we have a karma for her. You've got karma. All right, I think that's it on the make goods. Anything else? No, it looks like about it. All right, F cancer then. You've got karma. And today, the 20th of December, 2018, we have a list of birthdays. Not too long. We have three on the list. Congratulations to Rob Wales, turning 58 today. Sir John Knowles will be 46 on December 22nd. And Amanda West says happy birthday to her friend Adam Barrett. He will be celebrating on December 22nd as well. Happy birthday from everybody here at the best podcast in the universe. It's your birthday, yeah. And we've got to... Let's do the titles now. Why don't we do that? I like doing it this way. Douchebags. Slaves. Is we all thank your brothers and sisters who gave us some of us nights, some of them days. For the titles are a change. Two title changes. We discussed her in great length. Dame Patricia Worthington becomes Viscountess uh, today, the Viscountess of Biscayne Bay, and Sir Francis of SRQ becomes Earl of Southwest Florida. And congratulations and thank you both for supporting the show. Time for our knights. If you can grab your blade between your pages, I have it here. Uh, I don't between see between my pages. Ah, oh, got it. Okay. Up on the podium, please. Jack Connors, Dwight Chick, and Jeffrey Marcy. All three of you, gentlemen, are about to join the illustrious roundtable of the No Agenda Knights and Dames for your support of the show in the amount of one thousand dollars or more. And I am therefore very proud, as always, to pronounce the case be. Sir Jack Connors of Broadwater County, Sir Dwight the Knight, and Sir Jeffrey B. Marson. For you, guys, I've got hookers and blow, red boys and chardonnay, tea, Earl Grey, hot, cookies and vodka, warm beer and cold women, brisket and barrel-aged copper ale, redheads and rise, beer and blunts, cowgirls and coffin varnish, geishas and sake, ginger ale and gerbils, bong hits and bourbon, and mutton and mead. NoAgendaNation.com slash rings is where you can uh, 
and give Eric the shill your details. We'll make sure the ring and the uh, sealing wax and your official certification gets to you ASAP. And please tweet out a picture when you get it, and we always love that stuff. Thank you for supporting the No Agenda Show, the best podcast in the universe. <clears throat> so they're cracking down on drunks in Canada. No. Yeah. Play? Yeah, new Big drunk changes driving changes to the criminal code came into effect today. If you're stopped by a police officer now, anywhere in Canada, expect to be um, a demand to be made from you to, to provide a, a breast sample. Officers can now demand a breath test from anyone they lawfully pull over. They no longer need evidence of a reasonable suspicion that the person was drinking. And maximum prison terms for many impaired driving offenses have been increased from five years to ten. Ten years. Of course, the intention is to make us safer, but at what cost? As Jayla Bernstein tells us, civil rights activists are concerned about who might be targeted. Just doing a ride spot check tonight. Any alcohol for you at all? No. A question that's perhaps quite innocuous if you're sober. But for visible minorities, interaction with police can be a minefield. I have people around me, especially men. They've been stopped while driving in their life 30, 40 times. They're not criminals. They don't have any uh, criminal record. Uh, so just the everyday reality of a black uh, person that drives. She's worried about how police will use their new powers. Every time a, a person of color is uh, stopped for no reason, it leaves a trace. Uh, uh, it's not just the incident in itself. It's uh, sometimes the violence of those incidents. Did you smoke weed? Wait a minute. Canadians are racist? Unbelievable. No. This is an eye-opener. No, no, me. no, no. I can't believe this. They're not racist. Well, it seems that they are. Hmm. So let's play part two and we get a little facts. Canada has one of the highest rates of driving deaths linked to alcohol in the developed world. And advocates say it's partly due to the lack of so-called mandatory breath tests. (laughs) In fact, many countries already have mandatory testing programs in place. After Australia first introduced it in the late 70s, the number of deaths on the road dropped by 20 percent. In Switzerland, where mandatory screening started in 2005, drivers testing positive for alcohol fell from about 25% to about 7. 7? Huh. Yeah. You know, being from the future, I can tell you exactly where this is going eventually. It'll happen here. It'll happen everywhere. In France, it's already, besides your yellow vest, it's already mandatory to have a breathalyzer in your vehicle. So the next step is, is an easy one. You blow the breathalyzer, otherwise it doesn't start. This which is, is which is actually a, a circuit that's available. It's yeah, it exists. It's in Texas has it all the time for DUIs, and it's uh, you can just you can just see it coming down Broadway. You're gonna need it for your insurance. That's how it always starts. And uh, hey, you got nothing to worry about if you don't drive drunk. It's not a problem. Just blow into the tube. Blow into the tube, slave. You may go. <laughs> Did you see? Uh, Sadly, there was no video of it, but uh, Junker the Drunker oh. fell over again. <laughs> no, there were, did you see the video of him trying to get up the stage? Yeah, but, that's from, that's, but that's from the NATO summit. That's old. No. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, never that's, seen it before. No, that's your typical internet. Like, oh, look at this. Well, okay, that was three months yeah, ago. I agree with that. That was three months ago. No, apparently it happened again. He missed a step and tumbled and tumbled backwards and people had to catch him. <laughs> well, people got to keep a camera on that guy. <laughs> yeah, really. How could you miss that? Or was there some form of denotice maybe? You got to wonder. He took a tumble. <laughs> the guy is apparently just a raging alcoholic. No, it's sciatica, John. <laughs> you think he's a raging alcoholic? Jeez. The Belgian government has fallen. Over uh, a version of the yellow vests? You, no, I, no, it's Junker that has fallen. <laughs> After Junker, then uh, Belgian went, shit, here we go, too. We're, we're, we're going down in his wake. And they've come up with... Uh, I see this article that I was reading. It's, uh, it's a Dutch article. Oh, wait, maybe there was... Um, the French, the yellow vests somehow have gotten it into their heads, I'm not quite sure, and someone's going to have to explain this to me, that, you know, the money that France doesn't have to fix the, the issues that, they, that, the, that the populace has 
they're saying if you don't have the money to pay for climate change stuff or whatever, instead of taxing us, they're suggesting Google and Facebook pay for it, which I think is great. <laughs> hey, well, Google and Facebook are all in on climate change, so maybe they should pay for it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, at Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, they, the, so the, the, the request is, you know what? These guys should be paying for it. Now, this would come in, in the form of some sales tax, I'm sure. Uh, so ultimately, the slaves will pay for it. But it's an interesting idea. I, I, you just got to respect the French, man. You just got to respect what they do. And, and we're not getting half the reporting of what's really happening with these protests. No, the protesting is, if even democracy now is not covering it the way they should considering that, you know, they're all in for protests. Mm. So the, the Trump Foundation got busted and closed down and shut, shuttered, more or less. Mm -hmm. And it was very poorly reported in this country, but I got a pretty decent report of it from CBC in Canada. And for the president, another legal twist today. His charitable foundation has agreed to shut down its remaining funds given to other court-approved nonprofits as the lawsuit against it continues. The New York Attorney General accuses the Trump Foundation of, quote, shocking illegality, functioning as a checkbook for the U.S. president's business and political interests. In short, that Trump's charity was about giving back to himself. My whole life I've been greedy, greedy, greedy. I've grabbed all the money I could get. I'm so greedy. But now I want to be greedy for the United States. I want to grab all that money. I'm going to be greedy for the United States. That includes during the 2016 Great. presidential campaign. It's true. Trump allegedly solicited donations for his foundation in Iowa. His campaign then decided which local charities got those big novelty checks. That was just days ahead of Iowa's vote on the Republican nominee. Lawyers for the foundation say any infractions were minor. You know, I agree with you that it's very poorly reported, and I don't understand why. Isn't that exactly what you want to say? Ah. Oh, Stop talking about the Clinton Foundation. Look at Trump. No, Trump. that's the no, no. I think you're wrong. Okay, I think it's poorly reported for the exact reason you said. Ah, because people don't want anyone to be thinking no, about Clinton people Foundation. Will say, Wait a minute. If we're <laughs> going to do this with Trump, aren't we? Aren't we looking at Clinton more? Makes nothing but sense. So let's not talk about that. Let's talk about Flynn. Let's talk about <laughs> the Russians. Let's talk about this thing you had your early reporting on. Right, right. Uh, let's right. don't talk about whatever you do. Don't talk about the uh, why would they bust Trump's foundation when the Hillary Clinton fo or the Bill and Hillary Clinton foundation is really out of control. So it was repressed as a story by the mainstream media in the United States. They had to go to Canada reason. to get that report. <laughs> Those racist drunks. <laughs> those Canadians. Those, I have another. I actually got a couple of good stories from Canada. This one is interesting because I forgot about this. The Canadian Post, uh, which is their mail <coughs> service, <coughs> been going on a lot of wildcat strikes. And good news for people for before Christmas, they, they've they've restored. The service, finally. And good Except. news if you're hoping to get a package in the mail before Christmas. Canada Post now says it's caught up on most of its parcel delivery. The backlog was created by rotating walkouts by its employees who were legislated back to work last month. Normal holiday delivery service guarantees have been restored across the country, except in Vancouver. What? <laughs> except in Vancouver. Except in Vancouver, <laughs> Spasm's not going to get their mail. <laughs> oh no, Spasm's in trouble. <laughs> All right, I have a, a, a quick uh, update uh, clip. Uh, we talked about this. I don't know if this was a couple months ago, but the Chertoff group and the L3 guys, uh, it's happening. Travelers at O'Hare may soon be able to leave liquids in their carry-on bags thanks to a new scanner. It produces 3D images that give TSA agents a better view. Two dozen airports already use the scanners. O'Hare will be the first to combine them with automated screening lanes. They likely won't be used, though, until after the holidays. The TSA still testing the machines and training agents on how to operate them. Woo! Take your drink with you, slave. Is that that? What was this again? This is was that that big giant new scanner that I saw yes. in Oakland? Um, no. Does that, it look like a giant bullet? Yes, that's the one. Oh, I think it's gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really expensive. pretty. And, and yeah. the th it can't. It has to cost a mint. And now you can take your drinks in your carry-on thanks to the scanner. See how good that is. See how good technology is for us. Oh, yeah, they allow us to take our bottled water with us. Speaking of technology, 
I have to play this tech news report from Bloomberg. And I need to play this so that you understand why we're, the world is in the predicament that we're at. And when reporting about things that have gone horribly wrong with technology turn into glitches and you know, people just don't give a crap about trying to figure out what actually happened. Or, you know, again, uh, the, the no longer valid uh, occupation of being a journalist. So here's one of those people, Sarah McBride. I think we know her. Do we know Sarah McBride? Uh, possibly. Isn't she a, wasn't she on, uh, in, in the Silicon Valley tech person? I, it rings a bell. Rings a bell to me too. I probably know her. Uh, so she's on Bloomberg, which is a serious business, uh, operation. And she is going to report on the, uh, boring company's tunnel in Los Angeles. Now, there's okay. a lot of things I'd like to know about about this. You know, first of all, why is it so special that you know only Elon apparently can can bore these tunnels? Uh, what is the point? I mean, there's a lot of things I'd like to know. And yeah. and I, I yes, I was going to say I have a report from CBS on this. Tunnel. Oh well, let's do your CBS report and then we'll do the Bloomberg. This is, listen carefully because this is Gale. Uh, what's titled, bruh? The Boring Company. Of course, he used the. <laughs> okay, gotcha. I found it. Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has declared war on what he calls soul destroying traffic. He has unveiled a prototype of his solution, a tunnel beneath Los Angeles that he claims will revolutionize commuting. CBS This Morning's Gail King took one of the first test rides. You can go ahead, I think. How fast is this? <laughs> this is still slow. We're this doing is two, slow? only doing 20, 28, 30 oh miles an hour. Oh my God, oh my we'll God, speed oh up my God. After we get around the corner. This isn't just any tunnel. We can, go, oh. we can get 100, no problem, but we'll, we'll, we'll take it easy for you. <laughs> it's Elon Musk Tunnel. And to understand why we're speeding through it, you need to go back a couple of years when he decided he had had enough of Los Angeles traffic gridlock. Either we try something new or we will be stuck in traffic hell for the rest of our lives. This is the underground network he envisions. Electric cars using street-level elevators to drop down into a series of tunnels. Autonomous technology in the cars ensure that they don't run into each other, despite going speeds over 125 miles an hour. Tunnels are, in my view, the only solution to urban congestion because we have a 2D road network and we have buildings in 3D. Well, I have to say that's actually answered some of my questions, a couple of them. Uh, I like that she said it's Elon Musk's tunnel. No one wants to be in that tunnel. Well, she's going, oh, oh I'm scared to death. And she's doing 20 miles an hour. Now, I, I want to explain what they, what, they were, what you didn't see, which is they show a, an animation of the cars. The cars are dropped onto this little mini platform, which I think has a couple of wheels on it that fit on the tracks in the tunnel so that cars is not, they don't need self-driving because it's the, it's little yeah, it's, tra- it's, a tra- it's tracks and it's a platform on tracks. It's a platform on tracks. The car, I don't know where the, this use the motive force of the car. I would hope not, but I think it probably does. And the reason I say I hope not is because what happens is one of these cars stalls in the middle of this 10 mile tunnel and, you know, stops, runs out of, out of gas. I guess the other cars can bump it forward. Uh, I also don't know what happens if a car explodes and catches on fire <laughs> in the okay. middle of this tunnel. I'm sure he's thought of everything. But I'm sh- but it's it looks to be only applicable to electric cars because I don't think you want a tunnel filled with carbon no. monoxide, which is one of the byproducts of a motor uh, gas engine, internal combustion engine. Well, let's listen. So, let's listen to. Uh, so that was kind of it was kind of a puff piece. You know, you bring in Gail. She's she's puff piece person. Yep, she and, missed her puff piece. and she did a little puff piece with him. Well, I think Sarah McBride was better. Sarah McBride is that her name? Yeah. Well, the event was super fun. Lots of razzle dazzle. This is Bloomberg Business News reporting. Lots of razzle dazzle. Well, the event was super fun. Lots of razzle dazzle. All kinds of celebrities and people just wanting to take a ride in the car. Elon was there. His girlfriend Grimes was there. His mom was there, and it was super fun to get a ride in the cars. So, talk to us about what that was like. So. 
The trip I went on was a little bit、uh, space agey. You got、Woo! in a modified Tesla, and it's been modified so that the wheels can fit along grooves at the side of the tunnel, and you descend in this. Batman-like elevator, and you come out into a tunnel, a small tunnel with a lot of flashing lights, and then the car kind of takes off. And、um, it has to be a self-driving car, though Elon Musk says in future it won't have to be a Tesla. All the demonstrations yesterday were on Teslas.、Uh, really? So next step、uh, for Boeing Company, Elon Musk just tweeted this: Loop is demonstrating high throughput at high speed. Target is 4,000 vehicles an hour. At 155 miles an hour. So, walk us through how this actually works at scale. It, it sounds like、scale. just a car on a track. Right. So, in one sense, it's really old school. As, as you say, it's a car on a track in a tunnel. But because no, it's、school. automated, Elon、What? Musk thinks it's old school. It's automated. It's almost done. There will be many, many cars. Many many cars going together, cars going together. a lot tighter than in tighter. existing tunnels,、oh, yeah. and it won't just be one tunnel. He's hoping that in the future, lots of it'll tunnels, it'll be layers of stacking tunnels. So stacking even though、tunnels. one car tunnel, at a time、car. can fit per tunnel, if you have a row of three or six tunnels. That's a lot more cars traveling、no! at once, and because they'll be going up to 150 miles an hour in these giant networks he envisions under cities. If that happens, it could take some congestion off the streets. That was only half this fucking sorry this report. This、That's、is a lot today. Bloomberg, yeah, twice. Bloomberg、no. Business News three times. Uh, actually eight. Uh. Okay, that was the worst report ever. Good, good find. <laughs> Sold us nothing. She、painful. got the details wrong.、Uh, if you heard the one from CBS, he,、uh, Elon himself said 125 miles an hour. So where's she getting 150, 155, which is pushing the limit of efficient. Especially, it's not going to be very efficient at those speeds. So、uh, I don't care if it's electric or not. Just- also, she makes it sound as though the cars go through one at a time, and the only thing that's going to create throughput is multiple tunnels. Yeah. When in fact, with a system like this, you, especially if it's landing, if it's on a platform that gets dropped on the track, you could just stack up. You can have a, like car after car after car, have a whole slew of them flying down the thing, so, you know, so, bumping into each other. I'll respond to to the end of your clip. Musk said we have. He said we have two dimensions. What did he say? We had two dimensional problems with a three D solution. Is that what he said? It's kind of interesting. He said that we're living in it. My summary of it because I heard it a couple of times.、I'm、well, let me. Thinking, you know what? We can also just go to the. Yeah, why don't you go play it? Yeah, let's see. Hour tunnels are, the, in my view, the only solution to urban congestion because we have a 2D road network and we have buildings in 3D. Ah, if that's so, why does why is he so obsessed with going to Mars? Why not just start a colony in space? I mean, we have space station. We can build. I mean, the, the idea is to get people off the earth. I don't know how、earth. you made that logical leap, but I'll keep continue because I think that. Well, no, the logical leap is Elon with his solution. So he's coming up with an interesting solution for a two D road network. Three D. No, the problem is a, is we have a two D road network. Yes, and he wants to make it a three D network by digging tunnels.、Right. So when. You know, he's talking about sending people to Mars and Mars colonies and living on Mars, and Mars is going to be great. When doesn't it make a lot more sense just to build something in space? Why do you, why do we always have to be on the surface of a planet? I guess it's just、oh, a general general question. I guess if he's so smart about things, why, why doesn't he just build this big space station? Well, why don't we just build a dome around this globe and then put people on the top of the dome? In other words, build a, a like a Dyson dome so we cover the entire thing and put holes in it so the sun gets through, and then have people living on top of the dome in little houses. That way, we'd have like a three D. We'd we'd ma- max out the three D part. Now, the thing about the two D, three D road things, every time they try three D roads, and we had one in the San Francisco Bay Area that collapsed in an earthquake, which was the double decker, double double decker roads. They have them all over Texas. You got one in Austin, I think. Yeah,、uh, that's 3D. Subways、By、are 3D. Subways are 3D. I got subways. 
And you go to Chicago, there's layers under the city of Chicago that you can drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's what's four layers. 25 miles an hour, but you can get out of town, get down. If you can get down there when there's only a two or three entrances, but you go down, that's how you get to the Billy Goat Tavern. It's underground. And so you go down in that underground network of roads and boom, you can fly out of Chicago. All right. It had nothing to do with my question, but thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> if you see something, say something. It's the same refrain this after almost it. every incident. I knew something was up with that guy, or I knew he'd do something like this. In fact, government statistics show in 80% of school shootings, someone knew about the plan ahead of time, a point dramatized by the anti-gun violence group Sandy Hook Promise in a chilling new PSA. Look at me! The ad shows a fictitious shooter launching his attack after a series of warning signs went ignored, a painfully common reality. Being able to report such concerns anonymously by app is a game changer for students like Becca Arabis Cockley. Yeah, I think a lot of people, they don't want to be like the snitch of the school. Senior Daniel Radka agrees. A few years ago, he heard a kid threatening a school shooting, but was too afraid to tell a teacher. I didn't want to get back to the kid that I had reported him. I did not want other people to know because it was kind of a joke and I didn't know if that was cause enough to tell anyone. Turns out that wasn't a real threat, but next time, Radka says, a reporting app would be way more in his comfort zone. It was kind of like the difference between having a phone call and sending a text. You don't have to deal with that person face to face. You don't have to talk to that person. You say what you want to say and then you're off the hook. Tips get triaged at a national call center by crisis counselors who can immediately involve local police and or school officials. They can also message back and forth with the tipster. Many schools say the app has already paid off. And these uh, youngsters will become fine, upstanding citizens of society in in their adult future. Yeah, members of Stasi. Yep, that's exactly. And so nice. I don't have. It's like texting. I don't have to deal with anybody. Which is exactly the problem. You see that in your dossier here, there have been three complaints about your threats. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have some complaints. You must, be, you must be a bad person. You have some problems, I think. This is not good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is great. This is uh, the old thing when I was a kid. I remember two or three things when I was a kid uh, that, were all, that were taught in grammar school. When we were actually uh, in grammar school, we were taught how to dance, how to uh, balance checkbooks practical things. And then we're taught about uh, the United States and how great it is, which is never taught anymore. And one of the things that kept cropping up were the horrors of what's going on in South Africa, where they're required, they're requiring the citizens. I'm telling you, this is exactly the, the, the kind of the, the mood. They're requiring the citizens to have ID <laughs> just to go one place to another. They're, they make them carry IDs. That was an we outrage. Would never do that here. The <laughs> other one was right after the uh, and what, what, communist. What year was this? Is it like 70s, 60s? No, no, this is 50s. 60s. 50s? Yeah. 60s. Uh, the other one was the, well, right, this was in the probably the late 50s or the early 60s. And this was very common. Oh, it's horrible how this Fidel Castro took over and they're turning neighbor against neighbor. They're making neighbors turn each other in, sort of snitching on the neighbor so that gives them a bad bad note on their records. And this is really bad that that this is going on. This is exactly and this was drummed into us, by the way, as horrible. Horrible that people would be snitching on each other just to get points with the government. Boom. Same thing you did, this story you just gave us. If you see something, say something. That is still available for licensing. Yeah, I don't know That's what's the wrong with people. Best jingle ever. Here's another story that was repressed. <laughs> uh, this ended up on Democracy Now! I didn't know about this. Twitter was hacked. <laughs> Twitter says it's investigating whether state sponsored hackers were able to gather personal data from its users. Twitter says the hack could be related to unusual traffic from IP addresses Ooh. in China and Saudi Arabia. Ooh, unusual traffic. <laughs> they, they actually released a report that said that. Is that what I have to believe here? That Twitter said, we're seeing some unusual traffic from China. Oh, it's unusual. We may be hacked. Is that what I have to believe from that report, Amy? I, I assume so, yes. Yeah, jeez. I have something that, now talk about suppressed. I think this is big news. 
This is about the borderline bar shooting in California. Um, you remember, how many people were killed in that? It was another horrible event. We've already forgotten about it. It was just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> it got, I forgot. Eight? I oh, don't remember. And a, and a cop or two, I think, is horrible. And yeah. some of the people who had uh, survived the Vegas massacre uh, were caught in this one as well. But listen to this. Drug enforcement agents say they surprised Irvine doctor Zung Pham at his Orange County home this morning, arresting the 57-year-old and seizing dozens of guns. The raid went down in Tustin. Um, 31 rifles for and almost 27 400 pistols years. were hauled away from the doctor's home, according to federal officials. And there's a connection, authorities say, between Zung Pham, his drug prescriptions, and the man allegedly behind the borderline bar shooting. It also extends, according to officials, to the suspect in a Costa Mesa fire captain's death. Mike Kreza's alleged killer was under the influence of drugs at the time, prosecutors claim, and he... ...told investigators that he was on medications prescribed by this doctor. And in his car at the time of the collision, they found pill bottles that had this doctor's name on them. Zung Pham was in federal court late today. According to the federal affidavit, five victims have overdosed and died who were also receiving and filling prescriptions from Pham from 2014 to 2017. Quote, from September 13th, 2018 to October 2nd, 2018, over 100 different patients texted FAM to refill their prescriptions, oftentimes dictating to FAM what they wanted. Agents say they have this text message about the borderline mass shooting that was sent by Dr. FAM. Quote, one of my patient just told me, it reads, that the Thousand Oak shooter, Ian David Long, had my prescription bottles that belonged to someone else. I never saw Mr. Long before, so I don't know the implication of this information. So here's what's interesting. One, I didn't hear about this anywhere. No one's talking about this. Where'd you get this? This is... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, can, I can find it for you. I, I don't know exactly where I got it. I, I, a producer sent it to me and a link, and I recorded it, but oh, I can find it. We need to know, but okay, go on. Um, so a couple of things. One, what the hell were the drugs? Why will you not tell us, reporter? This was very annoying to me. I what would drugs? say that was the number one annoyance, a, a lack of reporting on the specific the yes. specificness of the prescription of what the, what the drug was. And it sounds to me like it was a drug that may have been responsible for someone doing some crazy stuff. And this I is would in, agree with that. And this and is that's important. what should have been reported. And this is important. Uh, we're not going to find out yeah. unless someone else finds a report unless about this. Unless you get this. a hold of that Dr. Yum Oh, this Yum. is from KCAL. This is that uh, Los Angeles channel, uh, oh, okay. uh, Channel 9 in Los Angeles. Yeah. So... Uh, disappointing that they won't tell us what the drugs were i'd like to know i think we could start something we could get it going we could have a little conversation about it if anyone's and interested let me think kcal commercial operation probably has a few ah, sponsors yeah, they might have, yeah yeah they, get some drug money you know you get paid <laughs> to run commercials about drugs and maybe you know if you guys are going to keep slamming us as an industry we think we're going to pull our advertising exactly exactly it's people that do the shooting, not the drugs. The drugs don't oh, have guns. <laughs> Wouldn't it be beautiful if they laid that on us? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be that would be mint. <laughs> it would be great. Yes. So I have the uh, since we're talking about the guns and the shooting, I do have the report. You know, the Trump will never get. Or, you know, the Trump administration does a lot of stuff that. The mainstream media would be all for, except for the fact that it's Trump. Right. And so they did a, so they don't report it at all, you know, just to keep us, so we got to get our minds straight. So this, this thing here, this is, democracy now has no such qualms. So this is the bump stocks law that somehow got passed, which I think a lot of the NRA folks think was just not necessarily a good idea for a law, and it's kind of stupid. But, uh, but it, it brings up also a point on what these things actually did in the, in the eyes of Amy Goodman, ah. who have no clue, never saw it, shot a gun in her life, I'm sure. <laughs> do you, should we set up first what our understanding is of a bump stock? Should we, or do you yeah, want to do that? People want to know what a bump stock is. It's a, it's a, a it's the stock of a, of a semi-automatic gun that absorbs the uh, recoil and makes it so, and jerks the gun around in such a way that you end up pulling the trigger 
pretty f- quickly. You bang, 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 bang. You start, it makes, it's like bang, bang, bang. Quickly like, and very inaccurately. Yeah, of course. The Trump administration on Tuesday issued a new rule banning the sale of bump stocks, accessories that turn semi-automatic rifles like the AR-15 into fully automatic machine guns. The ban came more than a year oh, after gunman Stephen Paddock <laughs> used bump stocks to massacre 58 people while wounding 851 others at a concert in Las Vegas. Under the rule change, Americans will have 90 days to destroy their bump stocks or turn them into ATF agents. The lobby group Gun Owners of America <clears throat> promised it sue to prevent the rule from taking effect thanks amy i'm very informed now i feel much better about myself it doesn't turn a gun into an automatic weapon <laughs> yes it does it's not it's like as though you know well if you happen to have some sort of spasm in your hand and you start <laughs> shooting real fast it doesn't it didn't tur- you didn't turn the gun into an automatic weapon no uh, it does not it just is minor things i mean this is typical but I probably shouldn't be bitching about it. I have one last thing to share, which uh, I've been on for the majority of the length of this entire program, all its episodes, which is weather modification. And Oh, yeah. One of your favorites. And um, we've talked about... Before, before you go on, there was a weird anomaly last night. I have a clip. Oh, about the uh, thing in the sky? I have a clip. I want and, you know, I saw it. I want to comment on it. Okay. So this not this not the clip I was going to talk about, but <laughs> thanks for bringing it up. Here it is. And, you know, I saw it, too, and it was quite the sight. About 5.30, I was driving along Interstate 80 with my photographer when we saw it. Of course, I had to pull out my, fa- uh, my camera because I had to get this. Almost in the shape of a lightning strike, only this mystery vision was no flash. It floated high above us, providing a captivating view. Everything was dark. Except for this one little, like, white, like, reflective um, thing. Epi Haas saw the unusual shape in the sky while driving in Yuba County. And I was like, whoa, like, this is probably whoa. something rare that we're not going to see again. Londish Morosa took photos of the light while driving in Auburn, calling it a sign from heaven. It's very perfect. I'm happy when I see this. Willie Wood watched it from West Sacramento. Uh, it definitely appeared really close. It did not look like, you know, the distance of a shooting star when you see a shooting star in the sky. I mean, it looks pretty close. The National Weather Service Bay Area is calling this a noctilucent cloud, a cloud that can be formed from a meteor or space debris entering the upper atmosphere. There were some planned space events near the time of the formation. It appeared after NASA posted this picture on Twitter showing a crew of astronauts undocking from the space station. A planned Vandenberg Air Force Base rocket launch around that time was scrubbed and never took off. Sure. All right. You live out there in California. Uh, We saw it, and we have a bunch of pictures. I'll put one of them in the newsletter, if I remember. Good. For you. Uh, uh, Jay uh, caught a couple of good shots of it. So I go out. I'm going down to uh, grab something from the car, and there's this thing in the sky. It was an upper atmosphere. It was was just as the sun was setting, and it was so high in the sky, it was light. The the sun was still lighting it up. That's the reason it was so luminescent. Mm Mm-hmm. Because once the sun completely went away, that it was gone too. Right, and it looked to me because I've seen these before. I've seen Vandenberg launches. I've watched this, the thing go off and into the sky, and uh, and blow up. I, I've seen. I've never. I, well, let me finish. So I've seen a launch where I've seen this this stage separation and right over the head, and it's very attractive to watch. And this look, I, all, I, I didn't get to see anything that formed this. But I looked up and it looked like a rocket that had exploded to me. That's what it looked like to me, too. And, a, and especially a, since uh, Vandenberg says, oh, no, we scrapped our launch. Mm-hmm. Vandenberg's been trying to launch a secret spy satellite or something. Nobody will say it's what it national is. It's national reconnaissance. Be a Delta rocket. Yeah. And it looks as if it was. Lo- and, and there was some rumor about a rocket aborted first before they came out with the official statement. There's a some aborted mission. But the way they put it made it sound like it was blowed up and like it went into the sky. And then at some point they said, fuck this thing. And I'm Ooh, sorry. To say that. There it uh, goes. But they said, screw this thing. And they, because when you look at the explosion, there's a spot where you see where the explosion would have taken place and it would have flown in different directions, including that loop de loop thing at the top. 
and they just deny it and they come up with all kinds of then all of a sudden we hear oh it's a soyuz coming back and <laughs> hey, oh sure. it was a meteor swamp gas it's crap yeah north korea this is some missile that blew up. <laughs> that's what I. That's what it looked like to me too. Very high up, though. Must have been really very high, high up. That's why it was reflected because it was yeah. high up, high enough up. It was in probably even out of the atmosphere. It just it was an optical illusion that was looking close because it was a big explosion. And in fact, it it was mo- probably monstrous. And but it was so high up, it was being hit by the sun, the <clears> same <throat> way the moon is hit by the sun. You know, it's bright light, bright object in the sky. But, um, yeah, it's bullcrap. Something happened and it wasn't good. Some, now, back to my original topic of weather modification, which I've been talking about for a long time. In 1978, Secretary of Defense Cohen, at the time, uh, testified in front of Congress, the Senate, and said, listen, uh, weather, weather modification is real. Our other countries are using it. Our adversaries are using it. We need to be in this game and we need to be fighting with weather modification. And he also mentioned earthquakes, and specifically that some countries have technology to create earthquakes. And this is from the China, South China Morning Post, which uh, is, I guess is the only, I mean, it's reliable, as far as you can say it's reliable from China. I, I mean, that's... Well, it's, not, it's actually, I think, produced out of Malaysia, so I think it's pretty reliable. Headline, China and Russia band together on controversial heating experiments to modify the atmosphere. A total of five experiments were carried out in June. One on June 7 caused physical disturbance over an area as large as 126,000 square kilometers, or about half the size of Britain. The modified zone looming more than 500 kilometers high over Vasilursk, a small Russian town in Eastern Europe experienced an electric spike with 10 times more negatively charged subatomic particles than surrounding regions. I don't think I have to go on to explain what's going on here. Oh, I do. Another experiment on June 12th, the temperature of thin ionized gas in high altitude increased more than 100 degrees Celsius. That's 212 degrees Fahrenheit because of the particle flux. And they are doing, they're modifying the weather. And they actually talk about HARP, that that's our version of it. Of course, that's just conspiracy theory, just a stupid crackpot if you say that. I think we need to be very aware of what, uh, what they're doing. And how can it be okay for global warming and climate change if you're heating up, the, uh, you know, heating up high-altitude atmosphere to uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit? Well... Yeah, this is part of a more. This is part of a more of a long-term elite scheme of some sort to fry us. <laughs> <Can play those. laughs> yes, exactly. Well, maybe. Can't be good. Can't be good. No. Can't no. be good. You just got to wonder with the crazy weather that's blamed on climate change. Where's it coming from? Well, it definitely pushes the climate change agenda. It does. And what does that do? That that is the the end of Western civilization, as we know it. And that is the end it of destroy society as we know it. On that happy note, that is the end of uh, this episode of the No Agenda Show. It's your No Agenda Show, and we love that you support us in many ways. Thanks to everyone who sent in clips, ideas, background, questions, information, intelligence, knowledge, art and cash blankets water and i'm coming to you from downtown austin texas capital of the drone star state uh, fema region number six in the governmental maps in the five by nine cludio in the common law condo while it lasts in the morning everybody i'm adam curry and from northern silicon valley where i'm now looking forward to going downstairs and having some more of my delicious homemade sauerkraut I'm John C. Dvorak. We return on Sunday. Remember us at Dvorak.org slash NA. And please stick around for our after show songs with the Michael Buble from Down Under. Adios, mofos! Gather round, children. I have a tale to tell. Of a cute little green frog who wasn't the least bit gay. 
Peppy the green-faced fascist Was a very harmless meme Hanging around on MySpace And in other online zines All of the trolls on 4chan Knew that he was public domain They would appropriate him For their evil shit post game Pre-election 2015 4chan came to say Peppy with your face so green Won't you be our alt-right me? Then how the Nazis loved him And they tweeted out with glee Donald Trump was elected The rest we know is history Peppy the green was a very harmless thing Hanging around on my space And another online zine All of the trolls on 4chan Knew that he was public domain They would appropriate him For their evil shit post game Pre-election 2015 Chen came to say Peppy with your face so green Won't you be our alt-right me? Then how the Nazis loved him And they tweeted out with glee And Donald Trump was elected The rest we know is history Donald J. Trump is now President of the United States <laughs> Berkeley Hummer, Jill Abramson. Berkeley Hummer, Jill Abramson. The original, Jill Abramson. Vocal fry queen. Queen. I grew up uh, here in Manhattan. Manhattan. All day long. I read the New York Times all day long on my iPad app. I read the New York Times all day long on my iPad app all day long. She's got worse. All day long on my iPad app. Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi went missing after paying a visit to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. Hold on there. How do you even say Khashoggi? Khashoggi. 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 We have the official pronunciation. We've been trying to figure this out. We have the official pronunciation. Yes, we do. The official way to pronounce it. Wow, Kasuji, Kasuji, is you so clownish? Say Kashogi, forget it. I want to do Sharpton's way. Forget it, it's racist. Okay, Kashogi, you may now play the pet peeve jingle. Thank you both, I appreciate it. Slash N-A. Can this bitch run the country?